Assalamualaikum and very good morning to all. Uh, saya ambil uh, apa kesempatan ini untuk mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Mr. Chokiman walaupun uh, dalam keadaan uh, kesibukan beliau okay, uh, dalam menyambung pelajaran uh, to further his PhD tapi beliau masih uh, berkesempatan lah untuk agree and say yes to me uh, bila I invite him to be to our workshop. Alright, so let's begin. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. So the key parts for this workshop, um, just to let you know, uh, before you, before you, um, you know, start to start to think about what we, you will be learning today. My approach in um, teaching academic writing for the past, I don't know how many years already. I started teaching academic writing, uh, academic writings, back in 2010. So it's 10 years, right? But the, the, the ironic part is that uh, now that I'm also a PhD candidate, uh, so whenever I write my own uh, writing, it's just papers or even thesis, I tend to be too aware of how I write and how I, you know, how I uh, construct my papers and all that. So sometimes knowing too much is also difficult because you tend to overlook or overanalyze things, which uh, somehow will kill the process. A paper that should be written in a short time, you end up taking more time than usual. But I'll be sharing with you what I have summarized as what I call as Aspire. Uh, you might have heard of, uh, you know, different mechanics, different components in academic writing, but I summarize it in this thing, what I call as Aspire, because it covers almost everything that I have observed for the past 10 years, even you know, I have. I think I have proofread and edited close to 100 theses, um, not just PhD, but also masters. The ironic part is I'm not even a PhD candidate yet, but I have been editing a lot of PhD theses. And uh, sometimes I, when I analyze and also edit all these theses, I tend to learn a lot actually from the whole process. So I'm sharing what I know. Uh, whatever is useful for you, please take away. If it's not useful, throw it away. <laughs> all right. Or maybe... Uh, you know, try to try to benefit from the whole process. And then I will share a bit of useful tools. Um, yeah, I know. So I can, so I can, this, this is the challenge in workshop. Some people ask for English, some people fast for Malay. I, I will try my best to do Dui Bahasa. But I think my, my slides, all this while, memang quite easy to follow. Kalau ada part yang you tak faham, you just let me know. All right? I'll be more than willing to help. Okay? So, but I think in postgraduate studies, you have to be comfortable with both languages. Uh, sometimes, I don't like the, the mentality of, oh, I'm writing my thesis in Malay, so I only want to learn everything in Malay. You should also be, you know, reading materials in English and all that. And the same thing with, the, um, with those who are writing thesis in English, because having access to both languages would really add values to the way you write your essay and also your research papers or research writing. So some important tips as well will be shared. So, kalau ada part yang you tak faham, just let me know. I will be more than willing to uh, go slow. Like I said, everything is recorded. Um, you will be able to review and, uh, you know, ask me again from time to time. So, kita tengok yang ni. Look, let's go for this one. A quick introduction just to, just to kick off the whole session. Look at this, um, apa ni? Look at this uh, comic, all right? Um... If you look at this, you get that I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realize that the purpose of writing is to inflict weak ideas, um, to inflict, um, you know, weak ideas, obscure, poor reasoning, and exhibit clarity, right? So, uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I know we have a lot of uh, foreign uh, students as well in, on campus, and some, some foreign uh, students might be joining this session so i'll be using both languages all right no worries i and i fully understand all right because <laughs> when i teach academic writing courses in 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 Unimas, uh, you know it's always like that when i'm teaching in english i'll be code switching to malay and when i'm teaching in malay i'll be code switching it's, it's like that but look at take a look at this comic you'll be uh, wondering whether it's true or or not but i believe it's true in a sense that um, academic writing is just learning the skills of inflating your weak ideas. Well, you may think your ideas is weak, 
But the moment you support them with some evidences, with citation, it becomes so strong and it becomes so solid. Then suddenly your point, your so-called weak points or your weak ideas become powerful. And then what matters is the last one, in inhibit clarity. It should be clear. Pokok pangkalnya, whatever you write, kalau you tulis sesuatu, orang tak faham, everything dies. Means if you write something and people don't understand you, you fail, right? In a way, because writing is about conveying your ideas and there is no uh, communication going on if people don't understand you. That is the most important uh, part, right? So what, I, what happened was over the past 10 years, going through, and then some of my students might have heard of this, uh, this Aspire model. I've been repeating this many times because to me, it encapsulates whatever academic writing should be. And uh, I put it as a Spire model because it's easier to follow. If you Google Aspire model, you'll find my name uh, in Google. And I have shared this many, many times in different occasions. And I have revised it from time to time in terms of the, what I meant by the Aspire model. Okay, so I'll be going through this Aspire model one by one. All right, so I can begin satu satu. All right, uh, A-S-P-I-R-E. But along the way, as I'm explaining this, I'll also share with you some tools that I have uh, encountered or used and maybe you can also try to uh, use it as well right first one is what i call as academic voice so oh, sorry it should be this one now uh, when we write an uh, academic writing we have to make sure that we have that academic voice you know suara kita tu kena bunyi dia macam ilmiah sikit kena academic sikit tak boleh lah kita nak tulis uh, academic writing penulisan ilmiah tapi bunyi dia macam tengah me mendekal masih saja ke tengah bercerita ke and all that what happened a lot of time among uh, our writers is that we tend to focus too much on the narrative voice right narrative i'm not saying it's wrong narrative voice is useful when you're uh, when you are doing some narrative analysis or uh, uh, you know, recount of the event, like counseling, probably you, you'll be doing a lot of recount and a lot of narrative analysis. That will be okay. But even when you're doing narrative analysis, where even when you are doing uh, recount, when you turn it into academic writing, you have to make sure you have that voice. And the first key of academic voice is number one, is to avoid pretentiousness. This happens a lot among Malaysian writers, I noticed, because based on my analysis, textual analytics of uh, a few, not a few, a few, uh, you know, a few hundred of uh, writing from my students and as well as, well as postgraduate uh, uh, students. A lot of students tend to do this. They pretend that they are using academic words. What happens is they write and then they right click, they find a synonym, they get the biggest word on the list. Or they Google translate and then they get the, the big words, all right? Maksud di sini, instead of being academic, anda sedang berpura-pura menjadi akademik. Uh, so that's the dangerous part. It means you're using bombastic words, you use big words, and then you try to impress your readers. But the whole point of academic writing is not about impressing your readers, actually. It's about expressing your thoughts, making sure that people understand what you are trying to convey. There's no point for you to use big words and people don't understand you. You kill the whole thing. Imagine, I mean, I'm sure you have encountered some uh, poorly written articles where you have read so many times but you just don't get it because of the big words that they use all right i mean um, some people will argue big words is so subjective to a lot of people right big my big word and your big word will be different because of the level of english or for example some will say like this word to me it's a simple word to other people this is uh, you know this is a simple word but the bottom line is, if you can say it in a different way, in a clearer manner, then don't use the big words. Or don't overuse it, right? Or don't overuse them in terms of expressing your thoughts. You can still use the technical words. I'm sure the technical words are those words that you normally hear in your field. Like if you're doing in counseling, mesti ada perkataan-perkataan tertentu yang akan berulang-ulang. So make sure you use those terms because those are technical terms. If you're in learning sciences, same thing. You should be using words which are in the field let's say if you're talking about cognitive load you can't you can't translate that to something else because that is the term we use in learning sciences cognitive load you don't suddenly change it to something else like brain burden or something else because that is the term but 
other things that you can express it in a different manner, try to use it uh, clearly, uh, cl you know, improve the clarity first before you be bothered about all these bombastic words. Okay? I, have, uh, I like this classic example. I'm sure you can read this. Can you try and read this uh, text I'm showing you now on the screen? I'll give you some time to read this. <laughs> This is a classic example of what we meant by pretentiousness in academic writing, trying to impress people with all the words, but actually the idea may not be uh, that clear, right? Anyone knows what this is? You can just uh, shout out loud using your microphone if you want, or just put it in the chat. I'm sure you have seen this somewhere. <laughs> Any idea? Ada tak yang faham apa yang tengah baca ni? Anda sedang baca ni. This is how it feels when you This is how it feels when you encounter some um, how to put it articles, right? You know, every time I ask my students, they will say, "Ah, I don't read journal articles because it's look like it look like this." <laughs> All right? Because uh, too many big words sometimes, right? I just I just understand the second individual tak faham. <laughs> okay. Now the first rule of reading, the first rule of reading, if you, this is, this is my tip for you, huh? because I, I'm sure you have encountered a lot of uh, occasion where you found an article but you don't know what it means, right? Mesti ada uh, situasi di mana bila anda baca, anda tak faham. The first rule of reading is when you encounter something which is not really, uh, you know, meaningful to you, meaning you tak faham, is to dissect it sentence by sentence or word by word dulu. If you have attempted this for, for quite some time, let's say you, you, have, uh, you, you try to translate too many sentences and then along the way you realize that you're doing this too, too much or there are too many words you don't know, then you might want to skip this article and go for another article because there's no point for you to continue doing this because you don't understand, right? And then the chances, uh, will, the chances of you copying is there because bila you tak faham, you are the tendency untuk nak copy because you tak faham. That's the problem, all right? So uh, it, it causes the issue of plagiarism when you don't understand what you're actually copying. So let's say, let's say we do this, right? Let's say we do this. If I, if I, if I were to tell you a few, a few of these keywords, I'm sure you will know what it meant. As widely reported, two individuals ascended the apex of a geologic protrusion. Two individuals mean two, two people. Ascended means climb up. The apex of a geologic protrusion, apex means the top. Geologic protrusion could be a mountain, could be a hill, all right? To accumulate to, to gather, to compile, a sample of oxygen hydrate, water, right? In a metallic vessel, in a pill, right? Can you guess what it is now? <laughs> Two people went up the top of the mountain to compile water in a pill. Sounds familiar? <laughs> How many of you have heard of this? <laughs> Two individuals went up the hill to compile. Yes, it's Jack and Jill. Now you know what is this, right? One individual impulsively descended. One of them, you know, uh, fell down, sustaining grave damage on the upper cranial portion. Upper cranial portion is actually your crown, means your, 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 your front part of your head, of its anatom uh, anatomical structure, right? This part, the crown. Then the second individual, the second one, perform cell rotation, okay, tumbling, <laughs> oriented in the same direction, means the same, the, same, uh, the same direction. So you see a very simple thing called Jack and Jill when you rhyme. Kalau you inflate it, it becomes like this. It sounds so technical, sounds so complicated, but it actually means a very simple thing, which is Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, the upper portion of the uh, upper cranial portion of his anatomical structure. Uh, perform cell rotation, all right, and Jane came the other. It's the same because when you say came, came the other means it's the same. Imagine a simplified thing like this. If you say it out loud, people will have understood you, but you turn it into so technical. That is what we meant by pretentiousness. In academic voice, the first rule is don't be, pretend to be clever. Don't pretend to be academically sound when you are not, all right? So, how do you improve your academic voice? I'm not asking you to turn everything into like Jack and Jill. What I'm trying to tell you is you have to make sure that even if, even if you read back your articles, right, you will be able to understand what you're trying to say, right? Okay. 
this is how it looks like, right? I mean, if you look back at the, the sentence just now, this is how it looks like in a lot of technical writing. There is a strong movement now. Uh, if you go to plainenglish.com, a strong movement, which is I'm also part of that movement uh, in, the, uh, in this particular association. We are championing uh, plain English in academic writing. So we try to simplify academic writing to clear-cut English rather than using all these bombastic words when the whole point of, um, you know, in any academic or scientific research, the whole point is to let people understand what you are doing, not inflating your ideas, making it sound so complicated and sound so sophisticated when actually you're just trying to say something simple, right? But anyhow, you still have to use some academic convention, which I will tell you now. Are there a few things that you have to pay attention to in some of the academic voice? Number one is what we call as avoid flowery languages. Sorry, I be clear and straightforward. I'm not asking you to be so direct that you make it so, how to put it, uh, so direct that you make it so sounds like a nursery rhyme. No, be clear it means when you want to say it, when you read out the sentence, it feels like the meaning is conveyed. Right? The, the, the easiest way to do this is always to share your writing out and then let people comment. One way to improve writing is actually share it out, uh, you know, share it out or uh, uh, let people read and then people will tell you if they understand or not or else people will not be able to or you will never get the feedback on your writing. Flowery languages is very typical among Malaysian writers. Um, a study done by uh, Cambridge University, uh, Cambridge Academic Press, shows that every time they get manuscript from Malaysia, it's easily detected. Means if they, if they get a ma any manuscript, when they took out all the names, or when they, when they do blind review, the moment they read uh, you know, certain parts of it, they will know this is from Malaysia, even before they know the identity of the author because of this part. We love flowery languages. We love to go on and on on certain things and then we forgot to put the full stop or the comma, you know, keep one comma, 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 right? So avoid long or run on sentences. When a sentence has more than 25 words, you need to rewrite or, you know, oh yeah, I think it should be rewrite, not write. It means here, I'm not asking you to cut everything into very short sentences, but if you know that that sentence can be split, especially when it's above 25 or 30 words, then you try your best to rewrite or else, try to think of a different way of expressing that sentence or the expressing that statement. The rule is 25 to 30, actually. Not to say the rule, uh, the principle when you're checking your work, if you read a sentence and it contains more than 25 or 30 words, then you have to be careful because it tends to create confusion, especially when you have all these relative uh, pronouns like which, uh, that, who, you know, people tend to be confused because you put too many comments, right? And then reduce the usage of emotive words to, uh, to give, sorry, not to give, oh, so many errors here, to give factual or evidence-based statement. Um, this, is, this is not really critical, but it will be good if you can avoid this. Emotive word is like, um, data I'll show you some sample, but words like um, uh, exaggerated words, like uh, desperate, uh, very dangerous, you know, and, and all this, because when you make all these claims, all these exaggerated claims, especially when it's motion, you have to find um, evidences to support. You can cari something to support. Tak boleh kata benda tu sangat, sangat, sebelum semua sangat. Kalau kita baca essay, essay Bahasa Melayu or BM, we tend to see banyak kan? Sangat, 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 sangat berguna, sangat bermanfaat, sangat, sangat, sangat. How do you know it's sangat bermanfaat? How do you know it's sangat berguna, sangat bahaya and all this? When you put all these exaggerated emotion, emotional words or adjectives, you have to support it with uh, citation or evidences to say that it's really that bad, right? It's not enough by just putting the word then, right? Avoid that uh, if, if possible. So academic voice also tend to avoid this because if you have too many emotive words, it tend to be very personal, right? Okay, next one. I'm gonna edit that later. Formal and objective language. Uh, formal language, I think you know this, avoid spoken words, uh, personal pronouns. Um, but personal pronouns, it's a gray area now. I think a lot of articles that you have read so far will have words like we, right? but very rarely you see I. Um, it depends on the genre as well. If you are writing reflective essay, reflection, then uh, personal pronoun is allowed. Just that, um, how to put it, reflection 
it's not re really academic convention because uh, reflection uh, is kind of like a dis very descriptive writing. You know, uh, it's a, it's a descriptive writing that we tend to be very personal of it, but you can still input some uh, a bit of uh, evidences or support from academic sources. It's fine. But what I'm trying to tell you here is um, avoid all these spoken words. I mean, words that we normally use. There is, um, there is a saying that says, uh, write like you talk or write as if you're talking. I think this is the movement now, you know, the same thing like the plain English movement where we are trying to do this actually, trying to, trying to turn academic writing into something which is very spoken or like a speech kind of thing. But we somehow realize that if you do that, then you'll be inserting a lot of slangs, you know, all these words which are not uh, formal into your writing. So you still hold on to formal language, do not formal language, words that you think it's not really formal, then turn it into formal. Words like, for example, instead of saying students collaborate uh, together, you say, uh, well, hang out, hang out, the word like hang out, all right? Or, uh, you know, words that are spoken, spokenly used, all right? Then objective in giving points of argument, not bias. I think this is in APA 7th edition. If you, if you have the 7th edition of APA, the newest one, this is highly stressed in terms of uh, writing, um, you know, objective language. What it means is like this. Try your best not to identify anyone in terms of gender, race, or, or whatever it is when you're putting up certain statements, unless you're pretty sure or you have evidences to say so. Uh, we, we also uh, like to use this, his or her, right? His or her, his or her all the time. Um, in the newer uh, APA format, it says that we can just use they. Even you're talking about one person, you can just make it more conclusive by saying they instead of his or her, his or her all the time. So turn it into a bit more conclusive, uh, inclusive, a bit more uh, less bias, right? Even the author as well, if you're not sure of the gender, you shouldn't be using he mentioned blah, blah, blah. But if you're pretty sure of the gender, then it's fine. If not, then you can just use the author or the authors, right, to be safe. Then avoid contraction like can't, don't, and, and all this. Uh, all these contract, contractions is like um, short form, or how to put it, uh, words that uh, contract, right? Like can't, don't, and all this. So I'll, I think you know this. I don't have to go into detail about contraction. But the bottom line for academic voice is to be formal and objective. Right? Wait, let me see. Yeah, so there are three parts of academic voice. Avoid pretentiousness. Try not to inflate you know, ideas by using too many big words. Number two is to make sure that you, um, how to put it, be clear and straightforward. And then number three is formal and objective language. So I'm done with A. Any, any questions so far? If you have any question about academic voice. I know it sounds a bit weird because I'm, I'm talking about academic voice, but I'm talking about writing, not speaking. All right. Um, the thing is, when you read certain certain articles or certain uh, papers, you tend to know whether it sounds academic or not, right? Um, I'm, I'm sure you have read a lot of articles, like you know, when you use all these uh, technical words, and suddenly, oh, this is okay, academic, writing, right? So things like that. Again, I hear somebody talking. All right. Any other questions before I move on? That's a. How do you improve your academic voice? I think the more you read, the better you are. That's the key, right? Uh, a lot of students ask me, how do I improve my um, academic vocabulary? There's no other way <laughs> except for keep on reading, you know? Because the more you read, the more you are exposed to the structure, the more you are exposed to the words, the better you are. And of course, uh, you have to put a bit of work or hard work. Kena usaha sikit lah. Maksud dia, you cannot just simply take an article, but still put a It's not useful. You have to learn like, okay, this person says this nicely. I want to learn how this person writes. So you try to look at the sentences and see what can be done in, uh, in terms of uh, your own writing. Or uh, your draft, right? Whenever you do your writing, the draft that you are producing, try your best to uh, revise it from time to time. It's not like... Um, do it once and then just send. This is the problem when you do things last minute. I always, my, I always advise my student, when you are doing 
report writing or anything that requires you to do academic writing, it's not good if you do it last minute. Yes, you can send it and then probably you get good marks. But in terms of the way you improve your writing, it, it won't be that helpful. And then you will realize you keep using the same sentences, the same way of writing all the way because you don't improve in terms of how, you know, how certain ideas can be expressed. Right? Because when you, the more you read, the better you are. So if, you, if you're writing and you put it in draft, and then you look at it again, and then you can keep on improving. That's, that only works if you have time and then you start early. If you do it at very last minute, like 24 hours before the deadline, then you'll be just doing copy and pasting a lot of things and then do some minor paraphrasing and that's it. Hoping that your lectures will probably don't detect it and then just give you marks, right? Things like that. So if you really care about how to improve your writing, uh, you might want to spend more time looking at the draft and improve it from time to time, right? This is why... Certain, certain people took longer time to do their thesis, for example. Those by research would take more time. Uh, not really because they don't have the ideas, not really because they don't know what they're doing. They just don't feel like the way they write is, is good enough to improve the clarity. But it won't work as well if you don't write. <laughs> Some people say, I don't want to write yet because I don't know how to write. But it's always good to draft it out first. That's why these tools like, you know, all this... Uh, real-time tools like Google Docs and all that will be helpful because when you type it there and then uh, along the way, if you need somebody to take a look, you can just share the link. Can you, can you help me take a look of this part? Do I convey what I wanted to convey and all that? So after all, in, in any research writing, in any thesis, the whole point is people understand what you're doing. Imagine if you pass a thesis, you know, you, you submit your thesis, your examiner do not know what you're doing. So that's the killing part. It's not about the writing. It's wrong to say that I don't know, you know, my English is poor. That's why I fail my, I fail my, uh, you know, master's or my PhD. It's not about that, actually. It's about the clarity. Because if you don't understand what you're saying and the way you convey it causes confusion to other people, that is the reason why, uh, you know, people fail certain, certain uh, you know, PhD or even master's or even when your research papers got rejected and all that. Because the way you write is not clear enough, all right? Okay. If no, then I'll move on. Uh, this is the part that I will spend a bit of time because I think uh, a lot of people ask me this. Ada yang tanya pasal ni, scholarly citation and references. So, under Aspire uh, model, as means scholarly citation and references. I put the word scholarly. Maksud dia, bila kita cari bahan, memang ada banyak resources sumber di luar sana. Yang penting, it has to be scholarly. Dia kenalah dari sumber ilmiah ataupun sumber yang berguna. Alright, so... Um, how to put it? Try try your best to find the reliable and reputable one, not something which is um, uh, you know you just find it on the net. I I, I know you just Google and then uh, sometimes you find some PDF and then you just download and then you ask me is is this PDF journal or not? If 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 you are not sure whether it's journal or not, meaning you are taking it from the wrong source, right? Or, or maybe you are unsure what a proper journal looks like. Okay. Yeah, it could be peer-reviewed, scholarly. Bottom line is, um, it, it's from the reputable sources, right? Reputable sources. Some journal may not be peer-reviewed, right? But it's reliable. Same thing like news article, good. News article as well, as long as you get from the reliable sources, not some fake, um, not fake news. Uh, I, I'm suddenly I turned into Donald Trump. Some, um, what do you call that? This blog, uh, because a lot of blogs these days, a lot of blog this it looks like news portal and then i have encountered a lot of students citing all these people and then thinking that it's actually news portals uh, they are not they they are blogs right and um, the the thing about all these blogs is like they get the viral stuff on twitter or on facebook and then they start to they start to how to put it they start to put it in the you know in 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 their web page and then it looks like uh, proper news now uh, you have to you have to make sure those, uh, how, how to put it, those news portals are uh, clearly stating their uh, affiliation or even the company details. Like the star, if you go to the star, it's clear. You can have the, the, the star publication and all that. All this reputable. And you can always check. Somehow, uh, you, um, you can just Google the name and then they will tell you like this is, this is some, some even a parody, you know, a lot of uh, parody news portal. I have seen students citing all these parody parody portal when they are just making fun, making joke, but they treat those news as, as true. 
So you have to read it carefully before you uh, you look through. But I always advise you to go for the the reliable sources, those famous one that you already know, like for example, National Geographic. Uh, what else? All this uh, journal, all this list of newspaper like the Star, New State Time, all this popular one. If you uh, see some news portal that you have a bit of doubts, then you might want to uh, check first, right? A bit of checking to be done. You can always ask people, ah, that's the best way, that's, that's the easiest way. Or go to um, like our guys, our, oh no, cannot call guys now, Patari, our library as a reliable source of uh, resources there as well. So that's how you refer to, to the reliable one. Okay. As much as you can minimize referring to web pages. I'm not saying that you shouldn't read them at all. You, sh you can read them. Like uh, Wik Wik Wikipedia, a lot of people say, don't read Wikipedia, don't read. No, you can read Wikipedia, but use it as a way to develop your understanding on the issue, not as a source of citation or references. Because Wikipedia, to me, some of the resources are very useful in developing our understanding. When you Google or find, or find something, chances are uh, Wikipedia will, will come up first. So use that as a basis of understanding the overview of the thing that you're finding. Then go to the references down there and start to check whether you can find all these things, all these references that they are referring to. Use those as your further reading. Right? Then you go and read them further. But the website are just helping you to develop the general understanding, not as a source of citation or references. All right? uh, books are normally used for solid theories. Uh, a lot of people say you cannot cite things uh, you know, older than 10 years old and all that. Books, normally you can go as far as, as long as you want if that is the main source of the theory. Some theories existed in the early um, you know, 19th, uh, 19th uh, one uh, one thousand nine hundreds, right? You know, one nine zero zero kind of thing, right? Or even before that, if those are the sources that you are referring to, then the the year doesn't really matter. You can even cite things in nineteen twenty, nineteen twenty three, you know, and all that. Like a lot earlier, a lot of earlier psychological work from uh, Vygotsky, we have Skinner, all these people. They are very early. Those are solid theories. You you can still refer to them as the main. Uh, you know, sources, even though it's very old, right? Because those are the origin. In fact, if you, are, if you are using certain theories, for example, and you know that the theory came from someone, let's say, in the early 1930s, but you are only referring to those in the recent one, like 2019 or 10, then something is wrong because you're not referring to the original source. You're referring to what people say about the person, right? Faham? Masuk di sini, kalau theory, Boleh guna sumber apa, yang lama-lama Asalkan itu adalah sumber asli Ataupun asal kepada teori tersebut Tak, tak kisahlah dia serat, uh, seribu uh, You know uh, 1932 ke apa ke tak kisah well, It doesn't really matter But If you're talking about latest trends Or findings Or if you want to check what is happening now If you want to claim certain thing Which is very recent Then it should be recent In a way between five to ten years, right? Uh, Dr. Rehman asked about medium.com. Medium.com is a blog, right? It's not uh, very good, but there are some news agencies or uh, reputable publishers who publish in medium. So you have to check the publisher, not the medium.com, but the writer of the of the post in media.com, uh, medium.com, sorry. It's, it's not the medium.com as a whole, right? Because they, they also have blogs. I also publish in medium.com, but you couldn't cite me directly because uh, I'm not counted as a reputable uh, publisher. But those reputable publisher, if they publish in medium.com, then you might, you might be able to cite them. But again, in any academic writing, websites, web links, uh, blog posts are counted as not so scholarly, right? So you have to refer, still refer to the, the books or the journal article. That would be the best. So prioritize those first. Again, like I said, use all these web pages, blog as sources for you to develop the understanding because don't totally ban them you use them to understand certain concepts but when you want to back up your ideas when you want to justify your your decision in certain things that in your academic writing uh, try to go for the books or the journal articles right okay oh yeah paraphrase the sentences to avoid plagiarism i think this is also an issue I have what I call as uh, these five C techniques uh, in terms of the paraphrasing. 
5C technique is comprehend, change the structure, change the words, combine the ideas, and cite properly. So what I mean is like this. Let's say you have found all these scholarly things, you know, on journal, on books, and whatever, right? Next thing you need to do is to decide whether are you going to quote them directly? Kalau nak quote directly, boleh, but not too many quotation because too many quotation in your writing means you are not spending time to to really you know analyze the the whole reading that you have done and try to synthesize them because kalau kita just mb 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 all the time and then just directly quote them it means it's not good you are just taking everything from the book might as well just read the book right let's say if i have an academic writing and uh, 80 percent of your writing is actually you know 80 percent of it are actually quoted stuff direct direct quotation you might as well just tell me to read the original text rather than reading your article, right? Because 80% comes from the article. Might as well just give me the article, I will just read that, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going there, Martin. Right? I'm, going to get, I'm going to go there in a bit. Um, so you comprehend first, try to understand, try to understand the concept. Um, then uh, try to change the structure. If you have no way of summarizing in your own words or no way of rewriting it, Change the structure first. Don't change the word uh, first, <laughs> because I know sometimes when you when you when you get the statement from the um, from the book or from the journal, the first thing that you will do is to right click and then get the synonym, right? Uh, it's not it's not really good. Try to change the structure a bit, all right? Before you change the words, if you need to. This is very low, uh, you know, how to put it? Low way of uh, paraphrasing. The best is still to comprehend and then summarize in your own words. That's the best. Combine the ideas if, you, if it's possible. Sometimes the, the author express something in three or four sentences, right? Like uh, he wanted to say A, but he used three sentences to say it. So you might want to combine them and then simplify in one sentence. That's what I meant by uh, combine the ideas. Yeah, change structure could be back active to passive, passive to active, or even the way it, it was organized, right? Let's say the author says the impact of A is A, B, C, right? So you can always change it to the A, A B, C are the impact of the, the, the change the structure first because before you play around with the, with the word because that helps you to formulate the, the ideas. Again, this is very uh, low technique, you know, lower order technique in, in paraphrasing. The best way to paraphrase is still to read and understand the whole context and rewrite it in your own words. In your own words, doesn't mean everything, right? The keywords are still there, but you try to restructure and reword it uh, accordingly, right? Then don't forget to cite properly. So since Martin asked about this, I'll go, I'll go to the citation in a bit, but let me tell you what happened if you just point blank copying, you know, from the sources. This is what will happen. Imagine if you're doing this essay, theory perspective of personality development, and then you put it in, turn it in, and then it came out like this. Now, um, then you will see like even the first sentence is directly lifted from a source, which is if I click on 18, then I will, be know, I will know where you get it from. And then you can see that the citation is given, right? You can see that citation is given, but it's marked as copy. I will tell you why in a bit, but try to avoid this because this is like 71 uh, similarity index. What I want to tell you is turn it in software, the one that we have in Elib. It's not a plagiarism punisher or a plagiarism checker. A lot of people mis, mis, uh, misunderstood this. Turning in is actually a way to detect similarity. But it by no means, it means you are totally you know, plagiarizing. Sometimes your sentence could sound similar to other people, even though you have no way, uh, you, know, you didn't even bother about copying other people's ideas. So it's a similarity checker. So what happened is, if you treat it as a similarity checker, let's say if you upload this and then you notice that the first sentence is highlighted, it means either you're totally leave it or you do not know how to cite it properly, right? So you have to improve. Also, if you are pretty sure that you have not copied from anywhere, but somehow the sentence is highlighted, you might want to reconsider the way you structure it or just keep as it is because it's not nothing wrong with keeping the same sentence structure, right? I put it there already. The acceptable percentage is 25, right? Anything uh, 25 and below is considered as good. How do you know this? Easy. Upload it to turn it in. 
before it start turning orange or uh, dark yellow, it's okay. <laughs> if it start turning red, means it's too high. Similarity is too high, right? But anyway, you don't need to read the color. Just look at the, the percentage. Percentage is also very subjective because if you upload a page like this, one page, 25% is quite a lot, right? So you might want to uh, look at the page number as well. If you upload a thesis of 200 pages, 25% is actually very low, right? So, but in, I think in, in, in Unimas, the acceptable percentage is 25. Some universities go up as high as 30. Uh, I know in some foreign universities, like uh, even uh, Harvard, some courses, they allow up to 30%. Because there are certain terms which will be repeated, especially in technical writing like uh, engineering or in the sciences. The chances of you repeating the same way of writing is there, especially in the findings part. You know, when you read the finding, when you, when you report the finding, is the structure is the same. And then it will be detected as similar. And then it will be wrong for a, a, a lecturer or even yourself to just, oh, I plagiarize. It may not be because you have to read through first. It's a similarity checker. So you have to check which part is similar and then try to improve. Somebody asked, uh, Fitra asked, how about, uh, like when we do quality report, we have to input the participant opinion. What is the correct format to write the opinion? Oh yeah, I will go there in a bit, okay? Okay, right. Let's take a look at this first. Because uh, Martin asked about how do, you, how do you do proper citation? And then you can see here, even those with citation, ada yang citation pun masih salah, right? Masih, masih dianggap sebagai similar, ataupun tak di detect as, uh, well cited. So how do you do this? Take a look at this original statement. Many people who read the word yawn or yawning will feel the urge to yawn by Simon 2000 on page 5, right? Page 5. I use this many, many times. Those who have taken academic writing course will know that it's a very popular, that I, a popular statement that I use. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Many people who read the word yawn or yawning will feel the urge to yawn. This is counted as plagiarized. Why? It's exactly the same, right? And then you don't even bother to put Simon there, all right? Okay. Number one, plagiarized. Number two, you put Simon there. According to Simon 2002, many people who read the word yawn or yawning will feel the urge to yawn. This is also counted as plagiarized or plagiarism because no changes to the statement even though you give credit to Simon. This is what a lot of students are doing actually and it's wrong. Just because you put Simon there and then you just copy and paste the same sentence or the same statement, you feel like, okay, I'm fine. No, it's actually contributing to the similarity index as well and also the plagiarism part. If you would like to directly quote this person, then after, according to Simon 2002, then you should start with the quotation mark and then put the page number there, okay? Number three, researchers have found that by merely reading the word yawn and yawning, a person would have the desire to replicate the action. Notice that the whole sentence is changed, but it's still counted as plagiarized. Why? Because no citation given. I sorry, did that. Sendiri tanya, sendiri jawab. Because the idea is not yours, right? You are not the one who did the study and found that people who read the word yawn and yawning, uh, you know, will feel like, uh, will, will also feel the word yawn. So this is where, you know, uh, Simon 2002 has to be given credit, right? According to Simon 2002, a person would have the desire to perform the act of yawning, blah, blah. This is good because not only the citation is given, you acknowledge the idea, you also paraphrase the sentence. Faham? So, tak cukup kalau you just ambil statement tu and then you letak citation, then anggap tu dah selamat. Belum. You still have to change the sentence a bit. That's why I said the best is to understand, faham dulu apa yang you nak, you nak paraphrase tu, and then put it in, put the citation in. Alright, try to understand the whole thing first before you start writing. If someone didn't plagiarize, you, but it's similar to someone. Yeah, same thing. That's why if you submit uh, to journal, the journal will actually require you to prove that that statement is yours or you don't copy from anywhere, <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing, if, if they notice that those are generic words. Usually, journal will allow, um, they will say some things like a uh, certain level of uh, percentage. If reference, references included, is how many percent, usually higher. And then if references are excluded, usually a percentage will go lower. But again, because we are the author, we know where the sources are and all that. If you're pretty sure, pretty confident that that is not taken from anywhere, you can always send it to the editor and say, these are originally written by, by yourself. 
uh, and somehow the sentence sounds similar but may not be may not be uh, you know the published on somewhere and all that but usually it's very rare la. very very rare for us to encounter an exact replicate of the same sentence except for like i told you just now certain generic pattern in reporting findings like there is no significant difference between, you know, when you report all these SPSS results, the sentence is the same, right? Doesn't matter who wrote it, it will sound the same. Some software will exclude this from the calculation, some no. Turning in usually, if you, if you put the word, um, there is no significant difference and all that, if you notice, you put it in, turn it in, turn it in, actually ignore it. Because they know that is the generic, that's the generic pattern in reporting your finding and it appears in different uh, position. But, if it's exactly the same, even the numbers is the same and everything is the same, then they will detect as uh, similarity in the part of the similarity index and meaning you're copying, all right? How student can access the name to do such a it? For postgraduate student, you can request from come, but I'm not sure how many accounts we have, but usually if you're doing coursework studies, uh, lecturers in the ELIP page can always set up one turn it in uh, submission and put the uh, submission as, as many as you know, until the deadline means you can upload as many times as you want until the deadline rather than one final version. Because if you allow that replication, so you can keep on uploading, you know, until the final uh, deadline or the copy. So normally in my case, for my course, uh, I will put up one link for students to check before the deadline means they can submit as many times as they want and check and improve. Because sometimes if you don't do this, you won't get the opportunity to learn and then you are punished directly based on one final output which is not really good so uh, so you can try to accept unfortunately turning is not free uh, so uh, the account in Unimas is quite limited i think but you can also use some other tools uh, outside there but it's not as it's not as robust as uh, as turning in lah the uh, the maksud dia uh, the quality dia tak berapa bagus the turning in all right the turning in uh, sorry the other than turning in the the software are not so good uh, out there the free one so um, i don't know you can request to you can request to come center for applied learning and multimedia just uh, go to calm.unimas.my uh, even or email uh, elip at unimas.my uh, to request for attending in account for postgraduate student you have individual account uh, or else you can ask your lecturer to create one in your course course page that will be easier all right okay next one is to quickly go through a bit on the correct uh, citation format i'm sure a lot of you are asking this i have one guideline but the guideline is in malay right the apa guideline is in malay but i think the the english version you can get go go and get it from one site that i always refer to the our website i'll show you in a bit but um these are some of the key ones right that you need to know key format to remember is the book journal proceeding magazine, newspapers, and web pages. You, it's actually by, by importance. The first three are the most important one, right? And then the two magazine and web pages are, you know, referred to when you need to. Magazine and newspapers usually we refer to when we want to cite certain recent cases. Like, for example, if you're talking about counseling and you want to cite certain uh, cases that happened recently, then you can use the newspaper or magazine, those that report the incidents and all that. In normal cases, if you're doing some academic writing, it's very rare for us to refer to newspapers unless we want to get the uh, latest happenings, right? Let's say if you, are, if you are claiming that the number of uh, mental, uh, the number of cases for mental illness is increasing, then you might want to refer to the newspaper and get some, some statistics from there. Or the best is find out if other journals are reporting this. That would be the best. Web pages and downloadable reports. These are also quite important to, to know because sometimes you might refer to web pages or downloadable, like those PDF that you download. Uh, how do you do that, all right? Before I go to the format, I'll show you the format for APA in a bit. But before that, this is how we use citation. Uh, Martin asked this, so I will emphasize this. There are two types of citation uh, that we normally use. It's called author focus and info focus. Author focus means you have the author in front and then information later. And then info focus means information dulu or information first and then citation comes later in the parenthesis or in the bracket. So there are two types. When to use author focus, when to use info focus. 
go for info focus if you are prioritizing the information. Maksud dia, uh, kalau fakta tu lebih penting, tekankan fakta, letak citation di belakang. Right? For example, definition. The focus should be the definition, not on the author. Right? So, put the definition first, then the citation comes later. So, when do you go for author focus then? You go for author focus when you are targeting specific details from this particular journal or this particular author. For example, theory. If you are talking about the founder of this theory or the father of this theory, for example, then you can go for author focus because he or she is the, uh, he is the, um, the, the, the person that created this, right? Or uh, she is the one who uh, formulated the, the guideline, for example. So you might want to go for author focus if you are going for the specific details. So this is the sample that you can see. First one is info focus. A recent study has proven that Unima students spend most of their daytime on Facebook. Notice that the citation is in, at the back because you, are, you don't really bother whether who is same and all that. You just want the fact, right? For example, you, you are writing an essay about the trend of usage, you know, uh, among Unima students. So instead of highlighting according to SIEM 2010, blah, 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 uh, uh, you, you put it at the back. Right? Why? Because the, the information matters more than, you know, SIEM. Okay? Now, if you want to go into detail of what SIEM has done, then you can, you can continue this by saying, SIEM 2010 interviewed 1,200 students from Unimas and found out that blah, 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 blah. So, you notice that this is more specific because when you go for autofocus, you want to get some details out of it. It's not just... Uh, like very general statement. Seem says this, 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 this. Very general, all right. Because if you if you go for general statement or general remarks, then go for the first one. If all focus, that's why in journal, most of the journal you read, you will notice that the citation are the first one, right? They put the citation at the back because what they are prioritizing is not the author. They will go for the author when they start going deeper on the what the author says or when when they want to show the differences of opinion. Seem say this. Ali say this, for example. So when they want to show the comparison, bila you nak tunjuk perbezaan pendapat, this is where you use the author focus because putting the authors in front, it means you are showing the argument between this set of author and the other set of author. But if you are just making claims, general claims, like many studies have looked into blah, blah, you just put the citation at the back, all right? Like what you are seeing now. So I put here, use author focus citation when you are going deeper on what the author has done or directly quote what the author said, for example, when you want to highlight it, okay? So this is the, the, the way to use the uh, info focus and the author focus. So these are the general rule. I'll go to the file in a bit, but uh, this is general rule first. I'll let you know. Use last name only in citation, although for Malay or Muslim name, you can go for first name or full name. Now, uh, there is no guideline in APA that explain about other names, right? They treat everyone equal. So what happened is, if you do not want to spell out the full name or the first name, you can still follow the international convention by putting the last name only. The only tricky thing about Malay name or Muslim name, name is that you don't carry the father's name. So uh, people will not recognize you. That's why in terms of the citation count and all that, there are pro and cons. Pro means... Uh, for example, if your father's name is Abdullah, then whoever is Abdullah and then the initial is the same, you get credited as well sometimes in Google citation, for example. They will count the, the, because the same name is the same, right? And then um, they don't recognize you, especially if you are female, then they don't recognize you because they only see the, uh, the last name. Like a good example would be this classic linguist, Malay linguist, Asma Haji Omar, right? Professor Asma Haji Omar. She normally will put Omar only, all right, in, in any academic writing. So people will not know that this is actually Asma Haji Omar. People only know Omar Omar all the time. So, so uh, in, in Malaysia, somehow there is an accepted convention where if you are citing Malay or Muslim name, you are allowed to put the full name like Asma Omar or just Asma in the citation, okay? But without all this bin binti or even haji haja or tan sri datuk sri datuk professor method, all this throw out because in it, the whole APA concept is everyone is equal, so you don't even know whether the person is a king or a queen just by looking at the name because you don't have that that name inside. All right, I mean the the titles inside. Use and 
when citing names in parentheses and bracket, I think you need to know use this symbol and percent and percent symbol n. Every time you put citation, if it's in the bracket or in the parentheses, turn the n into m percent. All right. Sorry, not user. Use n. Use n when citing names. Um, wait on. Use N when setting name in sentences, like David and Helen. So because it's part of the sentence, then you cannot use the symbol. All right? That's why I said, uh, <laughs> I, I, I mentioned this a lot. Like your name, right? Diane Siti, Norul Shamira, Awang Talib. If your name is too long, every time people want to cite your name, they'll be Diane Siti, Nahmiza, Awang Talib, says that, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly, and they want Diane, and then they say that all the time. So what you can do is, I would normally go for the last name. So in your case, you could just use Awang Talib, you know, your, your, your father's name, for example. If you don't want, you can use your, your first name, Diane Siti Nur Shamira. All right. So this is the thing. When you publish in the International Journal and all that, they tend to be confused. And then they, they thought that your name is only one. But, you know, in Malaysia, some name can be very long. So, so it's always good to, have to, to use. Uh, the, but you will, you will still use the full name in the, citation, uh, in the references anyway. The, only the citation you try to you try to uh, how to put it try to choose one lah you know I either the last name or the first name okay the whole point is be consistent if you want to put the full name then all the name should be full formally name if you want to uh, if you want to use first name then all should be first name cannot be like suddenly your name is only first name and then the the other Malay author you use uh, last name it, it's not consistent it has to be consistent. Evelyn asks, if the book author is A, compiling all the counseling theory and ther therapy from all the founders of B and C, when we do citations, should we use A or B? <laughs> this, is, this is a very classic uh, question. The, the rule is not about um, citing the source. The rule is, which one are you referring to? If you are reading A, then please put A first, right? Or... You, if you still want to give credit to B, C, and D, you can just put B, C, and D, comma, or um, B, C, and D as cited in A 2002. So all this B, C, D, no year. All right? You should not put B 1940 because you are not reading that book. Every time you put a full citation, bila kita letak full citation like Ali 2010, David and Helen 2020, for example, it means you are reading that source. You are referring to that source. If you're not referring to it, then you shouldn't put it in your citation. You shouldn't put it in your reference because you are cheating in a way. Because you tak baca that thing, but you're putting it in your uh, uh, references or your citation. So what happened is, since you are reading A, and inside this A, there are many other citations, first thing to do is see whether you can get access to D, B, C, and D first. If you really can't get any access to B, C, and D, then only you credit to A. But you, you can also say B, but as cited in, in A. So I'll show you the, the format in a bit now. I'll change my screen. This is, this is in BM, but I will explain, um, I will, I will explain in, in, in English. Because the reason why I do it in BM is, you can see, right, this screen. Are you seeing my screen? Uh, the format APA, all right. Uh, the reason why I do it in BM because there are so many sources in English already. So the English sources, I'll put it in the link in a bit, but it's the same thing, just that I replicate it in, uh, in the, uh, uh, this format for APA. So those who want this uh, Malay version can, uh, can get it, all right? This resources on SlideShare that I put up has been, has been viewed uh, close to half a million, right? Because... Uh, a lot of people refer to this when it's in, in the M version for the Malaysian writers. But if you if you want to refer to the if you want to refer to the English format, you can go to the link that I will give you in a bit. All right. Again, APA is American Psychology Association. This is the standard that we use in Unimas. There are many other citation formats. Do not be confused. That's why if you refer to a journal or any article, you cannot just refer to the references directly and then put it copy and paste in your article because they may be using different formats. I have a lot of students who just copy and then they say, I follow whatever the reference put. They thought it's APA. No, there are many, many types of citation format or, and also referencing format. 
So uh, the one that we are using is APA. They are Harvard style, they are MLA style, Chicago style, even numbered style and all that. So you can use the information, but rewrite it in APA format or use the tools to, to, uh, to do it. The one that is inside this manual is the most popular version, which is the sixth edition. The recent one, the seventh edition, came out uh, earlier this year, but it was not widely popularized, popular yet because they, the access to this uh, seventh edition is, is not widespread yet. But there are some changes, minor changes only, which I will tell you uh, in a bit, right? So you can use sixth edition. If you, if you have sixth edition already, you can use sixth edition as a guide, but uh, just change some minor things in the seventh edition, right? Yani, I don't have to go into detail. This one is already explained just now. I want to tell you this. Whatever you put in your citation, it should appear in your references. The rule of APA is, it's not a bibliography. Bibliography means suggested reading. Uh, suggested reading means, even if you don't cite it, you can still put it in your bibliography. The concept of APA is, the references should replicate the citation. If you have 10 different authors for your citation, then the 10 references should appear. They can summer. Kalau ada Bailey dalam uh, your karangan or your essay, then Bailey kena keluar dalam rujukan, senarai rujukan. Apa yang digunakan sahaja. Whatever you use only. Alright, whatever you use only. So these are what I told you by the name. Let's say if it's Chinese name, uh, Chua Kiman, you should be using Chua. But if I type Chua Kiman in my article, for example, the international audience would cite me as Man 2009. I get this a lot. Uh, people citing me as Man 2000, uh, you know, Man as the surname because they, they use the last name as the, the last word as the last name. That's why if you notice when I write in my article, I will flip. I will put Ki Man Chua because they will detect Chua as the last name, right? David Beckham, same thing, right? Beckham, Jimmy Chu, Kim. If you have English name for Chinese, you still use Chu because that is the surname, same thing. William B. Gates, then Gates. So these are the convention. But for Malay name, like I told you, you have an option. You can use full name, right? Like this one, Dato Ali bin Rostam, for example. You don't have to put the Dato and bin. You just put Ali Rostam and all that. For Malay name and Muslim, you have a choice. You can actually use a full name if you want to, or first name, or use the, if you follow the APA convention, then it should be only the last name. So in this case, if you're talking about uh, Asma Omar, then you can only use, you can take out the Asma and then use only Omar, all right? These are some of the concepts. This is also some uh, guideline. Now, if you are writing your essay in BM, then the end can be changed to done, all right? Uh, so what author is that, right? This is citation, okay? Okay, this is the changes in the rule. Um, this is the this is the changes in the rule. I think I put the box up here. Okay, let me let me tell you what what is the difference in the APA six edition. Now, in the sixth edition of APA, if you if you put this um, how to put it, uh, three names Adam Ali and Ab uh, Adams Ali and Abu right the first time. The second time you use it, you change it to et al. So it's three to five authors kind of, kind of way. But in the seventh edition, I put here in the seventh edition, the moment is three and above, right? Or even meaning more than two, you can use at all directly. And then the format for at all is a, a l dot, not a dot a l dot or not a e t dot a l, because a at all, of course, it came from uh, Latin, but it's also adopted in French. Like, A is N, right? In French, right? In, in French, is N. A-L dot is actually abbreviation. Abbreviation for the word allies. Ally means friend. So, when you say Ali at all, or A and allies means Ali and friends. So, the format is E-T, A, O, and A-L dot. Not E-T dot, A-L dot. It's the wrong one because only A-L is abbreviated. Abbreviation with other dot. There's also a, a convention where people say you need to italicize, italic and al. Don't have to now. Uh, even in APA, they don't really italicize at all. But if you want to italicize at all, make sure everything is italicized, not just one or two. So kalau ada at all, ada yang you nak italicize, then italicize semua. Jangan italicize one or two. Okay. 
because the reason why you italicize is the concept of foreign language in the main language. Kalau you write something in English, anything which is foreign, then you will italicize, right? So that was the reason. But now that because you are treating this as a convention of writing, then at all ta italicize is not right? Yes. The new edition means, the new edition is very making, making life easier. The moment is uh, three and above, you just use at all immediately. Tak perlu, don't have to spell out the name first and then uh, use at all later. Easier, I think. I, in fact, I love this, I live, I love this change because they, they get the changes, they get the feedback from the users and then they, they change it. That's why sometimes when you submit article now, if you are submitting research journal papers and all that, they don't really question you much as long as they see you use at all and it's fine. No, you know why? Because they changed the rule of referencing. Last time in referencing, you only list up to seven names. Now you, you, you can list up to 20 names. That is the reason. Imagine if you have like 10 authors, how on earth are you going to, you know, list everyone and everything? So they just make it clear cut, just put at all in the, uh, just put at all in the, in the, how to put it, the, the, the paper, all right? Yeah, true, I agree. Sometimes the names are quite long as well. And then imagine if you have five authors, you are repeating, you know, and then you tend to forget as well. But they, there is a hidden rule of, of this. If you notice that the surname are the same, let's say somehow, I don't know, this, this is very rare, but in case the surname are the same, let's say you have Ali, Johnson and Johnson, and then another article, also Ali, Johnson and Johnson, then you you might want to spell out first and then uh, put the year put the year there because sometimes you know it causes a bit confusion if you put at all immediately because you could be referring it to the same thing right because it depends on how you structure it as well in this case if i put ali at all then i will know that i'm referring to ali abu atan just in case i have another article um, Ali, Nora, and Atan, for example, then if I put Ali at all, I'm, I could be referring to that one, right? That's why it would be good to list out first before you use at all for certain cases like uh, when the surname or the list is the same, right? Or else just use at all. It should be no, no problem. So now the citation is the same as a yes, correct. So basically, there's no more three to five author kind of rule. Basically now, only one to two, and then suddenly anything more than three, just go for this rule, which is this one, right? So I, I'm putting the sixth edition here just in case because some people or some general writing, they still want you to follow the sixth edition. They don't want you to follow the seventh edition. Then at least you know the difference between the sixth and the seventh edition. All right. Okay. Boleh faham ke? Okay. By the way, when I'm talking about at all and all this, this all this only appears in citation. It doesn't appear, the word at all will not appear in your references or the reference list. Dia tak keluar dalam senarai rujukan at all tu. At all, hanya keluar di dalam citation sahaja. Alright? So, hopefully you are clear. How do you cite author who share? Same thing. If um, if it's the same surname, you just cite Gerald and Gerald. No harm. Because uh, I will be referring to your, I will be referring to your uh, reference list. So, it should be, in your case, should be Corey, comma, Gerald, comma, Gerald. Unless you want to say Gerald, Gerald, and Gerald. Three of them. You know why? Because sometimes some journal article or even some books, they are written by family members, like husband and wife usually. In the Western culture, the wife will carry the husband's surname. So it happens like Victoria Beckham and David Beckham, it will be like Beckham and Beckham, even though you know Victoria should be Victoria Adams, right, for example. But if you follow whatever is given in the book, so you just put uh, Corey, in your case it's Corey, Jared. no, no, you, you don't have to put G, C and E. Because those are, you only put the uh, initial if you have two types of Gerald and Gerald, then it will be okay. Let's say one, you have Cindy Gerald, Emily Gerald, right? And then another book by Cameron Gerald and Emily Gerald, right? Then you have to distinguish the, uh, how to put it, the initial, just to distinguish these two, right? But normally, not more normally, the rule is just put Gerald and Gerald, right? The, the, uh, the last thing. Okay, I'll show you some sample in a bit if I think I have. Right. If it's the same year, I think this one you have to follow the APA rule. If it's the same year, then arrange by alphabetical order, then whichever comes first, you have to put it A. I think I need to write this. Let me see if I can write this. I put here 
I'm, I'm sharing here. Okay. Now, let's say if you have, since you asked this question, so I, I might as well just put it. I'm not sure if you can see this. Wait a moment. Let me just put it here. Okay. Can you see the bank? Okay. Let's say you have, let's say you have uh, Gerald and uh, Gerald. Gerald or Gerald, okay. Let's say, um, let's say this is 2002. Then you have, but this is from book A. Then you have book two or book B, also by Gerald and Gerald. Let's say in the same year. All right. Let's say in the same year. What happened now is, you will see like book A and book B, you will have the same surname and then the same year. So you need to use the A and B. So which one A, which one, a, uh, which one B? You look at the titles. So this book, let's say it starts with B. The title of the book starts with A. So this one will go 2002A. This one will go 2002B. Get it? For this one. So let's say uh, Gerald and Gerald, 2000A will refer to book A because it goes by the title. And then Gerald and Gerald book B will go for 2000B, goes by the title. I, I'm just using it simple B. It doesn't have to be A or B. Let's say this one, if I put it here is the intro to blah, blah, blah. This one is uh, signs. Okay. So you take a look at the title. Book B start with S. This one start with T, right? So which one comes first? All right, S, right? So this one will become, the 2002B will become A now, and then this one will become B, because it goes by the title. This is same year, same surname, right? If it's different surname, doesn't matter. You don't have to change, you don't have to put A or B. If it's same, um, same surname, different year, no problem as well, just keep as it is, because it's different year anyway. Um, so, so how about the year? So, so ikut tau, uh, no, you go for alphabetical order. Right, go for alphabetical order. Oh, if you are talking about Gerald and Gerald, but then year is different, then it's in uh, by year. Okay, let me go to the next. I clear this one below. Oops. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, next one. Okay, let's say you have, okay, I use Ali and Abu like easy. Ali and Abu. This is 1998. And then Ali and Abu 2020. Now, when you list in the, when you list in the uh, reference list, then this one should come first. And then this one, number two because you go by the year if it's the same surname all right you go by the year but if it's different name let's say ali another one is ali and what uh, ali and Aaron. <laughs> okay let's say this is 2010 right Notice that this one is Ali and then Aaron is AA, this is AB. Then this one will, will go up in your list in the senarai rujukan nanti. Tapi dalam senarai rujukan, of course you have to follow the format lah. This is not the right format. I'm just showing you the the sequence about the name, all right? Okay, boleh, Farina? What if we have author one, two, three, and four, then in the next sentence, we have author five. Can we still use author one at all in the next sentence? The sentence about author, f uh, wait, 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 I have to. If we have author one, two, three, and four in one, okay. Then in the next sentence, we have author five. Can we still use author one at all in the next sentence? Yes, can, because it's different anyway, right? Author one at all, and then five, because Anything is go by combination. You go by the combination of the year as well. So it doesn't matter if uh, if the uh, auto five. 
All right, it, it's different. Okay, it should be okay. Same year and same idea, but different author or same author. What do you mean? <laughs> still, still different. Anyway, either anything is different. If the name is different or the year different, it's counted as different already. You don't have to. You don't have to worry. Okay. Like this one, you see, you notice Ali Nabu. The moment the year is different, it's different already. But you only you only need to do some adjustment when um, the year is the same, the author is the same. Then you have to do some adjustment. Okay, right? Any question on this? The reason why I brought this up like this one, A and B, because the name is the same, the year also the same. Then you have to figure out which one is A, which one is B by looking at the titles. If any of it is different. Like Gerald and Gerald, but the the year is different. Then it's counted as different already. So you do accordingly, right? <laughs> okay, this is for citation. Let me let me go to the uh, let me go to the references a bit. Okay, now is the references for books. I think I I don't have to go into step by step detail because you can refer to the guide. But I will highlight what is what matters the most. Uh, the the format for the book is always last name, nama hai, last name, and then the initial, and then the year, the full title, italicized, then the place, and then the publisher. So if if you're looking at this, it means like this one. If you refer to this information just now, the name is Amy Comfort. So when you put it in your reference list, it becomes Comfort. A, because that is the last name. Then the year, the title, the title. This is the the part that uh, a lot of students tend to do the mistake. The title only the first letter of the first word is at uh, is capitalized, uh, and as well as the proper names or acronyms and all that. Then you uh, you capitalize the rest of the word. You just put it in small cap or small small letters like G A here, right? But if you are talking about proper nouns, like proper names, like Malaysia and all that, then you have to capitalize, of course. But uh, in in general way, just only the first letter of the first word is capitalized. The rest no. Then you have the place, right? APA says if it's a common city, the place is always city, city state, right? City state for US only. For other parts of the world, non US, you use city country. Get it? The place ni, tempat ni, publisher, right? The oh, kalau US, New York, for example, then you have to put New York NY because New York City in the New York State. Then you have to put NY, uh, and then the US cities you have to use the abbreviation, the short form of the state, like uh, Mason, Mason, Ohio, and, and all that. So it's a Mason, Mason, comma OH, things like that. Okay. The list, other I will give you the link later, but the whole list. But other than US, non-US cities, right outside of US or outside of America, you use city, comma, uh, uh, country. Now this is the thing about APA. If the city is capital of the world, <laughs> famous one, you don't need the country. Like London, everyone knows is in UK, for example. So you don't have to put the UK. But for me, my personal advice is it would be good to put the to put the country because sometimes different countries will have the same the same city, right? Who knows later? You know, if you go to London, you can find you know in every part of the world, in Australia, wherever there's so many places named London. So just to be clear, you can put there London, UK. But it depends on the publisher, by the way, not you who decide it. Refer to the book. Check the publisher, right? If they put their London, UK, then it's the one in UK, right? So that's what I'm trying to tell you. Kuala Lumpur, comma Malaysia, right? Even though you can just skip the Malaysia because APA says capital of the world, you don't have to put the 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 city, but uh, the the country. But it's always good to put it. So if it's Kota Samarahan, then you cannot put Kota Samarahan Sarawak anymore. You should be putting Kota Samarahan, comma Malaysia, right? City, country, not city. Uh, state for outside of uh, the Malaysia, you know, outside of US. <coughs> All right. Any questions for so far for books? This is for books. So, belakang ni, the, the back part is the same. 
sorry, the starting from year until the end is the same. Um, no change, Susan, no change. No change in uh, six and seven, same rule, all right? For, for the book, no change. No, for the format, no changes in the six or the seven, okay? So, Richard uh, Richard Nelson John last name is Richard no Nelson John is the uh, is the last name um, but I'm not sure how it's positioned so you have to refer to the journal if they put Richard comma Nelson John then Richard is the uh, Richard is the uh, last name but if they spell it out Richard Nelson John's then Nelson John is the last name all right so you have to check back so for references, the back part format is the same. The only difference is the front part. So it depends on the number of authors. So if it's one author, then you do like this. If it's two authors, then what happens is you just add the, the second name, second name here. The only, comp, the only difference is you will not see A and D in reference list. So dalam senarai rujukan, uh, at the end of your essay, there will be no A and D anymore. You only use A and D in the in-text citation. So in the uh, references, Put the names and then the initial and then end. You know, if you are two authors, then this is how you do it. Notice that there is a comma before the ampersand. So there's a rule here that you have to put a comma before the ampersand. After the first author, comma, ampersand, then followed by the rest of the name. If it's two, then true. If you have three, then follow the comma and then until the last, uh, the last one, the last author. Notice the title as well. Only the first uh, letter of the first word is capitalized. How? H. Mason, Ohio. Notice that the states in US, they don't spell out Ohio. They just put OH. All right. So only the states in US, you have to, um, how to put it, put the abbreviated version or abbreviation. So you can get the list in the, in the link that I'm going to give you later. All right. There's a whole list of states. You know why? Because APA, after all, is American uh, based anyway. So they, they prioritize the American uh, pub publishers and also uh, writers. Okay. This is just to let you know if it's three, same thing, right? Just list, 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 list. Now I put here six editions, say maximum is seven. Six editions, maximum is seven. But in the latest one, it's up until 20. So last time, not last time, sixth edition, you can list up to seven authors only. So what normally will happen is you list the first six, right? Then you will put dot, 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 then the last author. Okay, this is this is a bit tricky to explain uh, no, if, if you just read from this slide. So what happens like this? Let's say the paper has 10 authors. The paper has 10 authors. In the sixth edition of APA, you list the first of six, six, first six only, the authors of the first six, I mean one, two, three, six, or, uh, six authors. Then you skip seven, eight, nine, you take the last one. So the total names are seven, right? The total names are seven, one, two, three, four, five, you know, seven. But you skip the middle one. So if you have 20 names before this, you list the first six, skip everything and get the last one. So it will be only seven names. But the <coughs> new one, the seven edition, allow up to 20. So you list the first 19. If there are 22, for example, you skip 20 and 21, and then you go for 22. So it accommodates up to 20 names. I think it's very rare for us to get this, but in a lot of uh, uh, articles like Sciences, the Medical Journal, uh, uh, some technical journal, you will have a lot of names. So what happened is you list the first 19 and skip to the last one. So in between, you don't have the end, you just put dot, dot, dot. The dot, dot, dot means the rest of the, the, rest of the members, all right? If only seven, then you don't need the dot, dot, dot. You just list everything and then end seven. Bottom line is the total number of names that you have in the list in front before the year for six edition is seven for seven edition is 20 right you get me very rare lah. if you are still confused let me know but this is how it, it works okay 
organization can just put that in place of the uh, author. So some sometimes um, some publication can be published not by a single author but uh, by an organization like the World Health Organization. Then you just put the organization name. Same thing lah. The back part, if you notice, is the same. Title, place, and then the the publisher. Publisher is the last. All right. Okay. This is for journal. So just now it's book, now it's journal. Journal is the one that you should be re reading a lot um, for postgraduate uh, level. So like this case, Kevin Mickey, I'm just using some sample easier for you to remember. So the list, what I'll normally do is if you if you depend on software, that the one that I will show you a bit is like Mendeley and um, Ref and Write, what else, uh, all this software. It's okay to use the software, but you still have to refer to this as your guideline because you some software it extract the component from the article and the article may not provide the information so you still have to do the manual checking you cannot rely fully on the software like endnote and all that because sometimes the, the way they extract the information may not be accurate so you still have to do, do a bit quick quick checking like especially this one the the pages usually is missing from the automated extraction so you have to find out the pages for journal Make sure you know the year, make sure you know the name of the article that you're referring to, and then you have the journal name, the volume, and the number, and then the, the pages, like this one. Okay. Become a good student is the name of the article that you're referring to. Journal of Education is the name of the journal that has the article become a good student, right? This is the volume. Notice that Journal of Education and 13 is italicized because we italicize the name of the journal and the volume. Okay. And um, then the pages. The pages has no PP. All right. No PP for pages because uh, journal, uh, well, my reasoning is like this. Anything that has a proper cover page and all that, you tend to have, you, you need to put PP for the pages right because page to page but for journal because sometimes you don't know when you get the article is independent on its own you don't see the cover page and all that then you know uh no pp is needed right that's my that's my reasoning right it's not APA, but that's how i remember the reasoning so if i refer to books if i'm referring to chapter in a book then i want to cite that chapter only then i will put pp dot the pages because the book has a cover front cover and the back cover, right? The page to page. If I'm referring to magazine, if I'm referring to newspaper, they have cover page. And chances are when newspaper, for example, this not online newspaper, the physical newspaper and the physical uh, magazine, you you will have uh, the page, right? The cover page, back, uh, front and back. So you need to put PP. That's why for magazine and newspaper, if you're referring to the hard copy, you have to put the PP. I mean, there's a whole list of APA when you refer to later, lah, right? But just to let you know, in journal, there is no PP. So if, if you put PP for journal uh, referencing, it's wrong. This is for referencing, again, referencing, all right? For the references that you put at the, at the back. Um, the new rule in 7th edition is, um, if the journal has DOI, right? If you, if you encounter the journal has the DOI, you have to put the DOI at the back. So after the page, you just put the DOI. And then the DOI has no HTTP. Right, no HTTP, just DOI dot. You have seen, have you seen the DOI before? Let me show you just in case. Just in case somebody do not are not aware of what I'm trying to tell you now. Oops, sorry. Uh, journal. Maybe get some recent one. Okay, if you go to any good journal, like this one is a, consider as good because it's under Taylor and Francis Online. All right, there's a DOI here, right? Okay, so you just copy until dog.org only. You don't need the HTTPS. Right? But uh, according to APA, if you put the HTTPS, it's, so, it's also fine. But normally we will just put the doi.org onwards. Okay, how do we put the pages if there's no pages in the journal paper? Huh? If the journal paper has no pages, something is suspicious, <laughs> right? First rule of checking whether the journal is okay or not, whether the journal is properly uh, uh, paginized, meaning it's, it has pages, right? 
So uh, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be putting your own numbers. That's wrong. Now, if you are referring to an online journal like this, what I'm showing now, for example, now, okay, like this, da, 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 da. you should get hold of the PDF first to get the pages. Or sometimes they will put it here, pages nine. 972 to, I don't know, so you can see this, right? If you download something, now downloaded something, and then a lot of suspicious things like no pages, no proper name, or that, then chances are you might want to check where, it, where does it come from first. Don't immediately put your own page number. That's wrong. I know sometimes you download a PDF and then you found that there's no pages, you just pretend that this is page one to page 10. No, all right? Now, if newspaper article, newspaper article, for example, and you are directly quoting, you, um, you want to cite certain part, you can use the word para, paragraph, right? Like this one, let's say, if, imagine this is online, fully online, there's no pages given. You cannot print this out and then suddenly give your own pages, no, all right? So you can, let's say you are, let's say this is the introduction, and then this is paragraph number two, Okay, if you're citing this, for example, I'm just giving you one example, then you can just put para2, right? P-A-R-A -A dot uh, space 2. Then people will know that you are referring to this, this paragraph, okay? Again, for journal, books, go for the pagenized version, meaning get the, get the PDF version and get the exact page. How do you find the impact factor of the journal? Wow, this is a tricky question. So. Impact factor usually will result out in the journal itself. Or you can go to the Simago uh, check. Like this one, if you click on the journal name, you will see the impact factor, like this one. Mind you, there are many fake impact factor, all right? So there are very a lot of predatory journal who, which list the, all kind of uh, impact factor. So if you are Taylor and Francis, then this is okay. Check the reliability of the website first before you refer to the, any impact factor. So any journal, like if you search here, you will see the impact factor, all right? Uh, the common one is Imago Search. This website, you just type Google's Simago actually or Science Imago. This is how we search for journal. So there's a journal of learning sciences to search. Then it will list out the journal name, and then it will tell you the you know, the details of it, like this is Q1 and then the impact factor and all that. So if you want to go for detail, you can just click the homepage here and then it will give you the proper impact factor. Okay, this is how, if, for those who are interested on in this one, but it doesn't really uh, matter. What happened is, now this is, this is go back to the scholarly citation and references study. There are so many journal articles out there, then which one should you refer to? To me, bottom line is, are you citing the right person? Let's say in your field of learning sciences, let's say you're from learning sciences, if you don't refer to this journal, then something is wrong. You refer to some, some journal which could be suspicious and uh, may, not be, uh, may not be helpful. But go for the main source first. And then if you have no other choices, but let's say, you, especially for local contacts, right? Journal for local contacts. Those of you yang nak buat kajian tentang Malaysia and all that, chances are you will encounter a lot of articles which are not published in uh, in journal yet so are they on preprint are they on dalam research gate are they on dalam academia and all that there are many sources so verify first if it's not published i mean in 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 journal you then you have to cite it like a downloadable report or a downloadable article just to acknowledge to people that you are referring to the one that you download not something which is published so the author knows that you are referring to the one that he uploaded on research gate for example if you cannot find it elsewhere in the journal or any other journal uh, on earth, all right? If you can find it, what no, normally what I will do is, if I encounter one article which is very good, but when I click on it, there's no pages, there's no detail of the publisher, then I, start, I will start Googling the name of the author, or I will start to, so I will put the, uh, the title and start to search. If I found that article somewhere else, in a, like, let's say suddenly it appears in Taylor, uh, Francis and mine, I will use this version. I will not use the, um, I will not use the one that I downloaded. So it's not, um, it's not a good practice to quickly found and then use it, okay? No, you can't. <laughs> There's no such thing in MP, all right? Uh, try not to. And it, the, more, the moment you use a lot of uh, um, unavailable information like MP, even no date and all that, it, it creates that suspicious of, um, it creates that 
suspicion that you are not um, you are not um, referring to the right source. All right. Okay. It's very weird, right? You say you tell people according to uh, Martina, two thousand ten, no pay, huh? Right? It creates the suspicion. Oh no! Oh, you mean no date? No date is okay in a way, but again, not a good practice. I know website usually blogs, uh, you know, newspaper. Sometimes they don't put the publication date. Rule of thumb for scholarly citation and referencing in academic writing: the moment you have any suspicion on the date, the pages, don't use it yet. Find out first, dig deeper. This is how we check fake news anyway, right? When you encounter certain like people forward you something, you want you might want to do some background search. Search dulu, search the title, search the author. Okay, I found it here, so this looks more reliable. Then use the reliable one. Don't use when you are not sure. All right? Okay. Same concept in 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 academic writing because when we when we present certain citation, when we present certain evidences, we want to be convincing, right? Not you put something and then mm, I'm not so sure about the date. I'm not so sure about the page. That it creates more suspicion. Instead of supporting your idea, it becomes it makes your argument even weaker. Sometimes, right? This is where those who write in thesis, some in a very critical point like discussion and all that, they use a lot of resources uh, from blogs. They will put like no date and all that. Then when you when you read, it doesn't feel convincing at all because you are referring to sources which are not really reliable. So that helps you to to get into that mode. All right, try your best to get the reliable one. Okay, since since we are here, um, if you go to googlescholar dot uh, dot com, I I like to use this one as a basis because uh, I have I have a video on this as well, which I will put in the link that later. Now, if if you if you sign into Google Scholar, sometimes it automatically redirect you to dot my up here. Right, I always advise you to sign into Google Scholar. So just sign in using your Gmail or Google account because it helps you to quickly save things into your library. Just in case you 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 don't have time to read yet, you just want to save. So just you can just quickly save them, and then you can come back to your to your list. Like here, if I click my library, I will be able to see the article that I have saved. Right, and then quickly quickly read through again. The reason is when you go to dot my, it limits your search to the Malaysian traffic. So Go to Google Scholar. Click this one. Go to Google Scholar, and then you will be redirected to the global one without the my. So it will not take into account the Malaysian traffic. So you are not confined to what Malaysians are looking at, and you are looking at the global uh, traffic when you analytics. So you get more articles sometimes, right? It may not be all the time, but sometimes you get you do get um, you do get wider spread. So that's the first thing. So when you search for article, let's say if I put here, right? Uh, journalism uh, and all that. For example, if you are looking for article, let's say I put here first, two thousand sixteen. This is how you can find the the year. This one, this is so underrated. A lot of people do not bother to click this. Let's say if you click this one and you couldn't download the article, you might want to click this all two version or whatever version. All right. Then you will redirect you to different version like this one. You can see this person uploaded here and uploaded here. It means I should be referring to the one by Taylor and Francis, not this one. Okay, so uh, same thing here. So like all four version, I will know where this is uploaded. So I will go for the most reliable one. Like this one, I have in academia. I have in ePrint and all that. So it means that let's say I encounter this in academia, I jump on the Taylor Academia, and then the article is not complete maybe. Right, like this one. Suddenly, I get this, but I don't have. Let's say lah, I tak ada yang ni bawah ni. I don't know where it comes from. Then I will search, and then I go for the main source. So this is where I will know. Okay, this come from this journal, so it's okay. But this 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 author is good because he uploaded the same article that you can get all the information here. So every time you get an article, PDF or whatever, check first whether you get all the detail. Like this one, the page number is clear. Right, the details of the journal is there, publication is there, everything is there, so you are sure that this is this is a proper journal. All right, okay. So that's for scholarly. For Google Scholar and all that, you can quickly check through it. All right, in the in the resources that I will. Yeah. So any questions so far for the citation and references? Let me go back to this one quickly. So that's for that is for journal. For websites, yeah. For websites, website. Um, this one. 
Uh, I purposely put website. Okay. For website or any downloadable stuff, by right, the, the date here should be the full date, right? The full date. The format is like this, 2010, June 1. So if you go to the news article online, let's say you're referring to the star, then you have to put the date, exact date, not the year only. But if you encounter some downloadable resources which doesn't specify the date, then you can go for the year. Okay, then you can go for the year. The minimum is the year lah, in a way. Sometimes you can put June like this, but as many information as you can for the, for the, uh, for the, for the date. So uh, sometimes they can say publish in June 2010, but you don't know uh, when is the exact date. So you just put like this, all right? Then the title, then retrieve from, HTTP, da, 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 da. actually no dot here. We move the dot, there's no dot in the end. So retrieve from, there's no more retrieve date, right? Since text edition, no more retrieve date except for this one even for even for the no date all right no more retrieve date just immediately retrieve from okay this is what uh who as you know martina as is now uh, no date all right again no date of publication and dot d dot you use it when you really 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 need to use this <laughs> like this one let's say you're referring to visit malaysia page uh, if we go to that link, there's no date, then then fine, because you need that information from the uh, Visit Malaysia page, right? If there's no author, no date, that's even worse. So try not to use it. Try to find other sources. Use it when you really, really have no choice, right? Okay. So arrange the, arrange the references in alphabetical order like this. Arrange A, B, C, D, right? no, no number. And then uh, there's a link to the English version. This is the link to the English version. Uh, I'll, I'll share it in the, in the link that I'll give you later for all the things, all right? But the uh, APA citation or format, uh, referencing format, it's always good to have that manual with you. Or if you don't have it, you can always refer to the link that I give you uh, because from time to time, you might want to check. In the Google Scholar page, they do have this function. You don't need additional software. I, I personally do not subscribe to any software for citation because I love to do it manually. But if you, if, you, if you do want to use it, just use something like this. Let's say like if I, what just now? Uh, this one. There's a, there's a icon there, there's the column icon here. Sorry, not colon, the quotation mark icon here, right? There's an APA format here given to you already, all right? Now, normally, if the article is good, uh, published by reliable sources, the, the information is complete, like this. But notice that something is not right with this title, the, the surname. Study T-W-S-H-I, right? Meaning something is not right with this, uh, the name. But you can still copy this into your Microsoft Word as a guide. Then you click this one and find out who are the, the, the author. In this case, the author is an institute. So instead of putting it in the short form just now, like this one, instead of putting it like this, then you should be putting the, the full name of the uh, group. Then notice the title as well. The name of the journal is not uh, it's not capitalized, so it should be capital C, capital T as well. So at least this one is the guide. Then when you refer to the actual source, you know where to change. All right, when you, you know where to where to edit. So like like that one has no DOI, so you might want to copy the DOI and put it into your uh, referencing. So this one is already good enough actually, without using other software like Mendeley and all that. So uh, good enough. If you have Mendeley, you can just drag and drop the, the file into uh, Mendeley and then it will extract. Same thing actually, it will extract more or less the same thing because it depends on how the article is formatted in the PDF version. Okay, all right. Um, if you're signed into your, if you're signed into your Google account, just click this star, then it will save to your library. Okay, it will save, it will be saved to your library. Then if I go to my library, I'll be able to read this article again. These are some of the tips for you to, to refer to. Now, how do you know that certain article need to be cited or not? We all can also look at the citation count, right? Like this article, let's say, is related to what you're doing and then it's cited by a lot of people and then you don't 
cite this article, something is not right, right? Let's say you're doing this topic about women's health, blah, blah, blah. And then you keep on using some article which is, you know, out of nowhere. But all this big one, like cited by thousand something, you didn't cite at all. Or this author, which is very prominent, you didn't cite at all. Then something is not right. So look at all this as the, like, I, like a guideline for you to decide whether the article is okay or not to be cited, right? And then for those who are doing postgraduate by research or those who need to do literature review and all that, you just have to click this one, related articles. And then it will list all the related articles with the same topic for you. So you can go through the, the articles without having to search one by one, right? So it will help you to narrow down your search when you're doing literature review, okay? These are some of the tips for you to, to improve. Also, let's say you read this article, um, you don't really understand what the article is trying to say. You, when you click cited by, you might want to read this, arti this article and see how people talk about that article. You are, not, you are not citing this article. You want to cite this article, for example, right? But you don't really know how. Look at how people cite them, right? If they just put one, um, one citation, then it may not be good enough. But sometimes, if you do this practice, you get to see how people elaborate the analysis that they did about that article. So that helps you to understand uh, the article that you're reading. So it's always good to refer to this as well, all right? Okay, those are for citation and uncle scholar. I hope that clears out a lot of things. If you have a lot of questions still, feel free to ask me later. So I'm going to move forward a bit. Just now it's about scholarly citation and this, so that part of took up quite some time. But this is a quick one. In any academic writing, try to give precise description. Be precise as much as possible. Like I told you just now, when, when, whenever we give facts or evidences, it should be supporting, right? Um, don't give vague sentences or statements without supporting. And when you give all the citation and the references that you choose, it should be supporting you. Maksudnya, bila kita merujuk kepada suatu sumber, sumber tersebut harus menyokong uh, statement kita. Bukan menjadikan statement kita makin lemah. Or create doubts. Uh, you know, good example would be Donald Trump. Like, you know, every time he cites something, that cite, the, the cited stuff is, is pulling his statement even worse, making his statement even worse because those stuff are fake, right? For example. Okay, this, are, this is a good example of how, how we look at things. So take a look at this example. Uh, you don't have to read it, just quickly glance through, right? This is how uh, a lot of academic writing is done. And then you see only one citation there. I'm not saying about the quantity, but if you read through this statement, there are many statements which are disputable, meaning um, create a lot of suspicion and, and, and not back up. So there are a lot of statements that cukup, right? Nowadays, the internet has become a common norm, blah, 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 right? And then this has shown that people uh, prefer to use internet to get information. But there are a lot of problems with this introduction, okay? First problem is unnecessary and vague. The rule of thumb in academic writing, if I read by the third sentence, I don't know what you're trying to do. I don't know your focus. Something is not right already. So in this case, when I read the first three sentences, I, I'm not sure. Are you going to tell me about Social media, um, are you going to talk about what, what are you trying to tell me actually? Um, you know, social uh, support platform, not sure, right? So usually we'll give a very quick intro in one or two sentences. By the third sentence, we should jump into our point already. Let's say this case is about online counseling. You want to talk about the impact of online counseling. Then by the third sentence, the, the word online counseling should be there already. Not until the end, right? Like in this case, it took up until how many? One, two, the fourth sentence. Then, you then only you see the word uh, counseling support, for example. But it's still very vague. So this is one one problem with this um, introduction. Number two, misleading. You say studies have shown that more and more young people are turning to online mode to get emotional and mental help, but you only give one citation. And I'm not even sure whether this citation is telling me about this or that. So when you would when you use words like studies means it has to be more than one, at least two, <laughs> all right? So you have to put like two, at least two citations. Or if you, are, if you are not sure whether a lot of studies have done this, then just go straight to the point. Just say, uh, uh, this author, Lesson and Campbell 2008, found that blah, blah, blah. Then, because there's only one anyway, right? That's the only thing that you put. So just go straight to the point. Then another problem is this one, emotive word. They are desperate. So how do you know they are desperate? Okay, 
so when you every time you use all these emotive words, you have to back up it with some citation. And there's no citation here to say that they are desperate. How do you know they are desperate anyway? Right? And uh, this, are, this are like blah, blah. So bottom line, the whole thing, another problem is, after you read this intro, you, you, there's no, there's no clear, there is no clear direction or where you're heading. What are you going to tell me actually? So if you want to tell me about the impact of uh, uh, online counseling, then it should be there in your last part. We call this as thesis, all right? The thesis statement. Why are we writing a thesis? Because the thesis is our strong point, the one that we want to highlight, the focus, the scope, all right? So the same thing in any essay, the thesis should come in front. Um, so it should be it should be clear. Like when you say it is therefore important to study this aspect, I don't even I'm not even sure what aspect are you referring to, right? Compare this one with this one, right? The one just now and then this one. Same thing, but different way of writing. Over the years, the use of online uh, technology to provide counseling support has grown. You see, very clear cut. Then I know immediately what you're going to do, and then you you have two citations to back you up. Although some researchers think it brings more harm than good. See, some, two. Well, at least two, okay? However, according to Glasson, no, no, no. Uh, you see, when you want to show the differences of ideas, you go to the author focus. However, according to Glasson and Campbell, online counseling has become a way of blah, blah, blah. Notice that this page number is given because when you do direct quotation, meaning you do not want to paraphrase, you ambil bulat-bulat apa yang dicakap oleh Glasson and Campbell ni, you, you directly lift whatever is said by Glasson and uh, Campbell, then you have to put the page number. So if I go to this book or journal article, if I go to page 20, I will find this line exactly the same, all right? You can do this for a direct quotation. But like I told you, if your essay is full of direct quotation, then it's not a good essay because everything is lifted directly. There's no, no sign of uh, synthesis or no sign of summary. And the client demand for such services is expected to increase in the coming year. So, so you put the citation there. So every time you say something is to increase, you back up with a citation, right? Then you give your point. In line with this growth, it is suggested that uh, there will be significant implication. Blah, blah. Notice that the word it is suggested is used. Why? To be safe. Meaning you are not claiming this yet, but it is suggested or you are proposing this thing to be done. You are not saying that it will have significant implication yet. Right, you will not know until you do it. So this part is good, all right. And then the last one, hence there is a need to investigate the impact online learning on this key area. So key area will refer to this like education, mental health, and social work. Sorry. Okay. So this is how you should be writing your introduction: <laughs> compact, straightforward, clear. You know what you're doing, and then the subsequent paragraph, I will know what you will go. You will go. The, for the impact of online counseling on this key area. So I would know that, okay, at least I know, okay, now I'm looking forward to, to you telling me the impact of online counseling. Compare this with this one. There is no clear direction at all what you're trying to tell me. All right? Every time you try to link from one paragraph to the other paragraph, try to give a hint what, what comes next. Like this one, it is therefore important to study. I don't even know what you refer to as this aspect. There's no, there's no hint, so I have to keep on guessing. Every time you force your reader to keep guessing and guessing and guessing, it's not a good writing already. It's not a good academic writing already. Okay? All right? So this is, uh, this is precise description. Then in line with precise description is the in-depth uh, elaboration. So you have to elaborate further. Not enough by giving one statement and then try to, try to repeat the, the statement over and over again. You have to go in depth. So how do you go in depth? Again, make use of all the evidences and all the recitation that you can find. Again, aim to convince your readers not to confuse them. If you put citation in, it should be convincing, not something that, oh, is causing, you know, causes a lot of uh, confusion, all right? And then provide solid and clear example, not merely the extent that are. Again, la, just, just try to, just try to back it up, not just listing up. So this is one example. You might want to read it first, slowly. This is the body part already, meaning the first point. Just now was the introduction, right? This is the first point. Imagine that this is the, you are reading this uh, full essay, and then this is the first point. There are many impacts of online counseling. One of them is it can help people talk more freely and help counselors to be effective in a counselling session. 
This is very typically Malaysian, right? Starting the first form by saying there are many impacts on online counseling. One of it is, right? Or in Malay, you will say, salah satunya ialah, blah, blah, blah. This is a very typical Malaysian way of writing the points. You should quickly, if you want to say is the first impact, just go straight to the point. The first impact of blah, blah, blah. That will be clearer. But if you look, look at this as well, it's loaded. There's so many things. Help people talk more freely, help counsel to be more effective. There are two things. Well, there, are, there, are, there are two things. But I w- if I read this line, then I would expect you to tell me more about these two things. But if you read further, it says the online medium is good in making sure the identity of the kind cannot be known that easily. Suddenly, this one is not really coherent with the first point. Then, clients are more willing to share since they do not have to use their real name in online medium and not meeting. So, if you want to talk about this, then maybe the first line should highlight you know, uh, the anonymity or instead of just saying more freely, just to make it clearer. Then you say, for example, Baker and Ray said that written communication allow clients to think about what they plan to share and revise a statement. Okay, this is fine. The Baker and Ray is backing up what you said just now. You said that people are more willing to share online because they can, they can remove the identity, right? And then they can talk to counselors or psychiatrists and all that openly, right? Without bothering about uh, the identity being known. Okay, fine. But then suddenly, according to Wenger 2008, the community of practice can help counselors to engage clients easier due to... Suddenly, you have another new point. This is a new point already. About helping uh, for, for counselors to have this community of practice. So this, this citation, walaupun nampak macam citation yang bagus, but it's not linked with your point. Alright? This is a bad use of citation. It's a good citation in a way. The source could be good, but the way you put it here doesn't sync with your... It's not synchronized with your point. So, dia jadi macam tak bagus. Alright, jadi lemah. So, this situation made the online counseling session to be more effective as clients are more willing to do. Again, this is repeated. You look at the last line, it's repeating. Alright. Poor topic sentence. Topic sentence is how you start your the point. Confusing, unrelated. I would have used Wenger maybe in another, in another point. I would have split this into two. This, I will focus only on anonymity, right? Maybe. And then the last sentence also not so good because it's creating a lot of uh, confusion. Then compare that with this one. Clear, right? The first impact of online counseling is in its, is, uh, in its ability to increase the level of anonymity. Then I know you want to, what you want to talk about. You want to highlight only on this one. Increase the level of anonymity. Previous studies on online counseling shows that this is a good way to, to, to say that you have read a few, not just one. Then you put the two citation here because previous studies, right? shows that counseling session done online improve clients' willingness to share due to his anonymity, especially where asynchronous text is crucially used. Then you elaborate further. You say it's asynchronous text. What do you mean, right? The online mode provides clients with the opportunity to express themselves more freely, as mentioned by Baker and Ray. Written, written communication, which is the text, allow clients to consider what they are saying and revise the statement without worrying about it coming out or wrong. This in turn made the client feel more comfortable. So you are trying to elaborate further, right? And then you're comparing it with... Uh, uh, face-to-face interaction, right? Then you back it up further. Identify what they call the disinhibition effect where clients or con- counselees, right? Finding themselves in a confidential environment. So it's still backing up the point of anonymity. We're still backing up this one. Okay? And then look at the last sentence. Therefore, practitioners believe that this interaction help them to work faster, be less repetitive and more efficient. Now, if you notice the line, this line, therefore, blah, 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 is actually leading to the next point. All right? So when you end your first point, the last sentence is giving me the hint of the next point. So in this case, I will know that later on, you will tell me how the next impact of online counseling is this one, lah, making it more efficient and less, less repetitive and all that because the last sentence is giving hint for the next point already. Right? This is smooth. Right, in terms of uh, ideation. So, for you, something for you to consider. I'm not saying that this is really a perfect writing or really, really good writing, but if you can write like this, to me, it's very clear already, right? Very, it's very good to justify uh, the point already. And then the, the transition from one point to the other is also there, right? So, try to practice this in your, in your writing. Some useful phrases, you can get this. Um, I'll have the list, full list, right? Uh, a bit of extra tip, this is R, reduce cliche and redundancy. I think you have seen this many times, but I just want to tell you. So once you have your draft, read through any redundancy, any repeated sentences or repeated same idea, different way or uh, cliche, just scrap it, right? Just delete. 
and then uh, you know or reword it. Example of redundancy or uh, like this one, like past history, words like past history. There's no history in the future. So history is enough. Free gift. If you say it's gift, it should be free. All right. Attached together. There's nothing which is not. Uh, if you attach something, it has to be together. It cannot be attached not together. Right. Uh, brief summary. The summary is already brief. All right. A true fact. A fact is already true and whatnot. There's so many redundancy in our languages that we keep on using. At the present, at the present moment in time, you can just use the word now, all right? Or by definition, this means that the word implies it's the same thing. By definition, straight away the, the the meaning, all right? So a lot of redundancy that you can take out. Macam dalam bahasa Melayu juga, we suka melewah. There's so many sentences that we melewah lewah, you know, keep on dragging. We can just cancel out and then go straight to the the strong point, right? Some idioms and expression are good. Some, but if you overuse in academic writing, it becomes annoying. <laughs> Alright, this is not like a PMR essay, especially, you know, teacher will force you put more idiom, put more idiom, you know, uh, put put all the uh, saying inside. Um, in, in academic writing, unfortunately, the more you use it, it becomes very annoying, right? So, uh, and some of Malaysian favorite cliche, these are some of the words by who, by crook, by the parcel, in a society nowadays, you know, every time you want to talk about latest trend, you will say in this globalized era, in this ICT era, same thing. So. And then the suggestion is always cooperation from all parties. This is very vague, very unconvincing way of giving suggestion. Your suggestion should be very specific to whatever you have mentioned. Tadi. Cannot be so general, right? Last one, last part. I think we're running out of time. Last part is effective structure. It goes with the one I told you just now. When you organize your writing, introduction, body, and conclusion, make sure. You know, it's everything is clear in terms of the progression. It has to be clear, right? Introduction. The introduction tells me what you want to write. Body will elaborate the point. One, two, three, four, five. And then the conclusion. Clear. Everything is clear. Smooth, right? But when you are starting off your, your essay, it's always hard to decide what to write next. So having a rough outline will be good. What to do outline here? Apa yang you nak focus? And then once you put everything there, then you do the restructuring. That's why I put effective structure as last. To me, you don't have to be bothered about the structure yet because you have to write the, the, the point first, you know, the key things first. Then you worry about the, the structure. Then baru lah you should uh, I, I, I treat this as like a Lego. So you, you treat every block of the Lego as like your, your point, 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 point. You find a lot of articles, write it out first. Do, do it a habit lah, you know, find one article, read, write it out, summarize one part, save it somewhere, you know, in the same doc even. Then put it uh, in a document. Then once you are once once you are done with all the parts, all the blocks, then you organize it. You know, put the structure. This is introduction. This should come in the body. This should come in the conclusion. Because if you keep on starting for introduction, you will not move, and then you will tell people, "I cannot write. I have mental block. I don't know where to start." That's, the world has changed a lot, right? We are in a disruptive era, so you don't have to organize like I have to write introduction first and then go blah blah blah. Even even those who are doing by research, you don't have to start with chapter one all the time. You can start with chapter three first. You can even start with chapter five first. Start with whatever you feel you feel comfortable first, and then you do the effective structuring. Like, like for thesis, for example, I always love to start with chapter three. Uh, people will tell you why don't you start with uh, literature review? Because to me, literature review is something which is compulsory already. We have to do it anyway. So as you read, you compile, 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 compile. But you don't have to bother about how to structure the literature review first. Bother about how you want to co conduct your study first, the methodology first. For, I mean, this is for me. So I will make sure the chapter 3 is done. Then, whatever information that I have gathered during the process, then I will use it for my literature review. Because literature review is not about, um, it's not about writing. I mean, literature review is the easiest chapter to write because you are not writing new ideas. You are just summarizing what people have told you, right? To me, the most difficult chapter to write is actually the methodology to me. Because the methodology, if you don't convey it nicely, people do not understand what you're doing, the whole research collapses. This is how you fail uh, a research because the methodology is not solid enough, not strong enough. Literature review, you can always, you know, uh, revise, revise and rewrite the flow and all that. And a lot of examiners, sometimes they just skip the literature review part, I know. <laughs> all right. They will just glance through. They will go and attack your chapter three first. But you, 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 you're so worried about your chapter two that it doesn't show any progression, right? Reading, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do literature review, you should. 
but the process of compiling it in a chapter it can be done later because after all you have you are reading all the articles anyway right so you read the articles when you're preparing for your methodology and all that uh, just write out piece B. treat it like a lego one paragraph a day one article one paragraph will help a lot right you can finish your whole literature review in, in no time because if you practice that kind of habit but if you want to cram everything like 100 articles and you want to do literature review now that's not going to work right okay so this is some of the tips that I, do, I would share with you. So um, this is for assignment or essay, right? I mean, I'm not uh, talking about the whole thesis. If it's thesis, then you go by your, your, your chapter organization. But if it's a proper essay, then it should have the um, clear overview of the topic, thesis statement to indicate the focus, introduction should not be too long, uh, depending on, on the, uh, the topic as well sometimes. But if you're talking about thesis, then introduction depends on the how foreign is the topic, right? If you are venturing into something new, you might need to have more info about the background, right? Because the, your examiner or your potential examiner may not really know what you're talking about because you're venturing into something new. But if you're talking about something which has been done for quite some time, you are just looking at a new area, then your introduction shouldn't be that long. You might want to focus on more of the, the localized context that you're looking at. Give more information there. Like for example, some people are doing like say virtual reality in, um, um, in education. It's, it's, it's been done for so many years. So in your in the introduction chapter, you don't have to tell me like 10 pages of what is virtual reality. Then after on the 11th page, then you tell me your context. It's a bit too late, right? So you, you might want to spend only one or two pages about the background of virtual reality and then go straight to the point. But if you're venturing to something new because people may not know what you're doing, then you might want to. Uh, elaborate further. Even then, it's a bit too long. So usually, introduction should be should be brief enough for people to get the context. Then the the body, right? Make sure each point is focused. Given uh, in elaboration, provide evidences, and then um, the conclusion is to summarize the key point and provide. This is something missing in a lot of writing. The last one, provide implication or suggestion. In conclusion, we in a writing essay, we should always learn to give a bit of implication and also suggestion. Not not the generic suggestion like have everyone should help each other to, to solve this problem. No. Specific. Let's say you have done your re, uh, reading, you know, you found out this and that, that, you found out five impact of online counseling. So what? Right? So what? So so this is this is the part where uh, uh, you ask yourself, so what? Right? Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, can you share writing tip for problem? Yeah, yeah. That one I will... Uh, I will talk about maybe not now the, the problem statement, but I can I can share briefly. In introduction, we indicate the topic and mention it has three advantages below by highlighting three advantages. Is Chinese style not good? What do you mean Chinese style? <laughs> mention it has three advantages below highlighting three advantages. Uh, uh, because just now you mentioned uh, Chinese. What Chinese style? Or we will we we'll say uh, that there are three objectives. There are three advantages. Then this down one by one. So should we highlight it in the introduction that there are three advantages below? Then first, second, third. No, or we don't need to mention three advantages like no, no. you mentioned, like very typical Chinese writing. <laughs> not really typical Chinese writing. It's a global trend. Uh, for for listing, just that what I'm trying to tell you is, you have to tell people that you're writing about advantages. That has to be clear in the uh, that has to be clear in the introduction, right? But you don't have to spell out the three. Don't don't do like. There are three advantages of, uh, like you said just now, uh, number one, number two, in the introduction. No, All right? Just say there are, there are, you can mention that there are three advantages of the, the, the can. Or you can just say there are advantages. Like the one I showed you just now, it doesn't mention the number. It just say there are, um, the impact of online counseling. Then you go, you know, your, your advantages paragraph by paragraph. So I don't have to count like how many, but, if you want to be clear, sometimes uh, it depends on the topic given me because this one is essay. I'm not talking about thesis. I'm talking about essay. Sometimes the instruction given by your lecturer is very specific, right? The lecturer says three. <laughs> so you have to convince them immediately in the introduction that you have three, right? If you have five, then you say five. I mean, that's the reason why the number is there. Or else you don't have to mention the number at all. You can just say there are advantages of blah, 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 blah. Then later on in the body, you can go one by one, okay? Um, yeah, I hope that answered that. For problem statements, uh, since, since, um, 
since uh, you know the question was raised about problem statement, it's very hard for me to explain now. I mean, because the time is running out. But problem statement part should be the problem statement, <laughs> not the background. There are a lot of students confused between background and problem statement because when you read the problem statement, it's still going on to the to the background. The problem statement part is where we understand the whole context of your problem. Some people don't like the word problem statement. Some people co call it scope of the research. In, in different convention, different, use different terms. Some people say uh, gap in research, you know, something like that, uh, problem statement, but, and all that. If you read through the uh, method books, a lot of research method books will tell you problem statement should only be one statement by right, right? But in most cases, in writing, uh, problem statement will take up some pages, maybe not too long, one or two pages, but the bottom line is that part is where we know about your gap, right? The gap of your, your research. So what happened is, in your background or in your introduction, you can highlight the key areas that you're looking at, blah, 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 you know, the background information about what you're going to do. But when I lead into the problem statement, this is where you narrow down the scope. So you can talk about, let's say, virtual reality has been studied here and there, blah, 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 blah. And then you slowly lead in and tell me that uh, your area of study, it has not been well studied yet. When I read this line, when I hear or when I, you know, when I, when I read this sentence in your uh, uh, introduction, I will know that you are leading me to the problem statement already, right? But it's not enough by saying the typical one would be, you know, lack of research, limited research, no research and all that. Because to me, this is already quite overused and it has, it has become a cliche. You shouldn't be worrying about whether there is lack or not. You should be telling people, study has done on this, but they look into this. Study has been done on that, they look at that. Uh, what you want to do is you want to look into this area, right? You don't have to keep on saying it's lack of research, lack of research, because everyone seems to claim that everything is lacking. <laughs> if you read 100 theses, everyone is lacking, then you'll be wondering. So everything is lacking means which one is new, which one is old, right? <laughs> so my point of view in terms of problem statement is should highlight the problem that you are trying to solve, not so much about what people lack, like, you know, directly. Just tell people point blank, you know, this, this person done this, in this area found this, this person found that, this person found that, and what I'm doing now is this one. Good enough, right? Because by reading that, people will know already whether you're venturing into something new or something something already being done many, many times. You don't, I don't even have to read your uh, problem statement to know whether uh, the topic has been done, right? Because sometimes by reading the front part, we, we kind of know whether... Uh, you are venturing into something new or repeating or reinventing the wheel kind of thing. So uh, to get more tips, you can ask me further later for that part. I'm not saying I'm good in that, but that's how I view problem statement. It should be revealing to people the problem that you're trying to solve. How important is that problem, in fact? Not so much about novelty, because I think a lot of people are so obsessed about novelty in problem statement. People will say, what is new, what is new? I mean, it's very hard for us to claim novelty these days, right? Because... Uh, just because you're doing it just doesn't mean that someone else in the world, in the part of the, the other part of the world, they're not doing it, right? If, if everyone claims no research, no research or limited research, then, well, something is not right. There's so many universities, so many researchers out there. You might as well highlight what people have done, you know, and then what you're trying to do, right? And why you are doing this, okay? In the, in the problem statement, okay? That, that, that problem statement area, and then the aim should be clear. This is where you decide your variable, you know, your whatever you want to do in your, in your research, okay? I think that's all. Yeah, that's the final slide. Any question? Um, the tools. Uh, this is the link that you can go to. Just go to this link later. bit.ly uh, writing FSKPM. Uh, what happened is you will see this. You will see this. Uh, wait, let me see, show this page. Go to bit.ly. I will type it out in the chat. Good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I replied privately. Okay, wait. Uh. Okay, this link. Bit the align, I think, the FSKP. So from there, I will put up the, the thing. You will see this. And then the slide for today. I'll, I'll amend the slide a bit because there's some typo in the slide. Then this is the APA format in BM. Uh, the English version, uh, I will just add the link in the, down here. Wait, let me just add immediately. In APA writing, should we write side by side in a, a four format like many articles we read? What do you mean side by side? Uh, can you elaborate on that, Evelyn? Uh, 
side by side in what sense? Side by side. Um, two, two rows. They always write two rows. Two rows? How, how, to, how to say that? It, you mean we column? Write a, a column, column, sorry, columns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that is not, uh, that is, that is not APA. <laughs> So, uh, right in a normal way. The APA is actually smooth one, 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 uh, one page. If you want to follow the, the, you have to be clear, by the way. APA, APA uh, style has, it's a publication style. Means it covers also, you know, the page numbering, the way you organize your page and all that. What we are talking here is the referencing and citation part only, right? Depending on your lecturers, some lecturers may want you to write the whole thing using APA style in a way starting from the first page, the, the running heads, the title, the heading, and then you can refer to the APA uh, style blog where it will tell you, uh, let, me, let me share the link. Meaning, you know, even the heading, everything, if you follow APA, they are, they are different way, you know. They don't, they don't use the normal uh, <laughs> style that we use, all right. So, uh, let me just grab this. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm showing you now. Okay. I'm showing you. If you go to this link later, this is a very famous owl. I love this. But do uh, online writing lab. I'm sure you have seen this. So you can, you can have some guide here. This is the, what we are talking about is the general, the reference list and all this, right? Uh, if you talk about general writing, if you click general writing, this is the whole APA format. Right? They will tell you the writing style in terms of the language, right? What else? Where is the format of the heading? Punctuation, grammar, mechanics, like this one. There are many. Um, wait, let me let me show you the format of where is it? Uh? The, uh, the writing. Let me see. Maybe the APA referencing here. The one in uh, the one that this link is already seven edition, so you can compare with the uh, six edition if you want to, right? Yeah, this one. The general format. The font. It will tell you what type of font, right? Uh, like font eleven. Uh, title page should be how how should you write your title page? This is how it looks like, you know. And then uh, the put this is this is the formatting, the the running head, the title page. This is this is completely APA stuff, right? If you want to follow, some journal follow this strictly. So if they tell you to follow exactly the APA style from beginning to end, then you will see from the format itself, all right. But in our case, normally we only refer to the referencing style and citation only. Okay. So this is this is the guy. So I'll share this link later. So you click you click on the you click on the like for example reference list basic rule. It will tell you the basic rule, right? Uh, authors. This is for this is it's the same that I did for the Malay version, but uh, this is English. All right. So let me just put it here. Now down here is all the tools already there. I already put up there. I will not go through the tools one by one because I don't believe I don't believe the tool will transform your writing. <laughs> Meaning to say, just because you use the tool, suddenly your writing becomes good. Academic writing depends a lot on the way you read and interpret the ideas or the, the way you write just now. If you learn how to, like I told you, write a statement, back up with the, with the proper evidences, that is more important than getting the tools just to put the citation in. In fact, if you notice, the um, the citation, how to put it, the citation uh, format, everything. You don't need any software to help you actually, right? Because it's already there. So uh, all the link of, that the famous one, like paraphrasing tools. And many people sell this, um, ask you to subscribe and all that. But it's a, it's a good tool to help. But don't treat all this tool as like uh, something that will transform your writing, become you no know, suddenly brilliant, right? You still need some time to read and then use this tool to help you to solve some problems only. Like for example, this one, paraphrasing tool. Paraphrasing tool is a tool to help you. Let's say I've copied this sentence. 
and I would like uh, Quillbot to help me. So I just put paraphrase. Quillbot will try to paraphrase for me. Then by highlighting the thing that it changes. So if you want, if you want more in, improved fluency, then it will try to change further. Then you can see some restructuring of the sentences. This is the free one. Uh, if you go premium, there are more, there are more, uh, you know, more features. But to me, you use this as a guide to help you when you want to get some ideas to change. Do not directly copy this. Like suddenly use this and then copy and then suddenly expect your writing to be brilliant. No. Use this as a help for you to get some ideas on how to, how to change certain sentences or how to paraphrase certain sentences. Okay? This is for English. Lah. For Malay, um, there is a Malay version. Not, not this one. can't remember the name. Uh, some, one company is selling it. I tried. Quite lousy. Because it just replaced the, uh, replaced the words only. Bottom line is, read, understand, and know that that part is useful for to back up your, your, your point. Then, you know, write in your, in your way of interpreting. That, that, to me, is the most essential part in academic writing. Not about impressing people with all the, with all the, you know, all the number of citation, quantity, and all, all that. But to, 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 for a start, it's always good to back up every statement with a citation. Some people ask me, how, how can you be original in your writing when a lot of things are, are, are citing from elsewhere? You are not citing elsewhere just for the sake of citing, right? You only cite when you need them to back up your ideas, to back up your points, not to simply just, how to put it, just put it there because everything seems to be from, from different sources, okay? So uh, you can still be original in the way you write. Um, and uh, back up it with your with your uh, citation and references. Okay, so there are many tools here. This one used to be free. I quite like this. Uh, Scholar C. Scholar C. But it's you don't have the free version now. In fact, when you sign up, you ask you to, for credit card. But uh, there are some Malaysian companies trying to sell it. What happened is Scholar C combined the article they try to summarize for you. Again, this is a this is also a wrong concept of using this tool suddenly your literature will become good. <laughs> no way, all right? You still have to read the article, summarize, and then try your best to try your best to link it up. But this tool is good when you have a lot of articles to read. This, this, this tool will help you to link the uh, relationship. Uh, this is what I like about this tool. So if you have a lot of articles to read, this tool will help you to synchronize according to the topics and it will show you the, the relationship between different articles. But if you do this manually, you can always do like what I told you this now, pergi ke Google Scholar tadi tu, click uh, related articles, and then try to check how, how uh, you know, different people talking about the, the same thing. Now, every time students tell me I cannot find something about this, uh, I always reply, you have not tried hard enough. <laughs> it's impossible uh, that something that you are trying to do is not done elsewhere, right? But, but, access to those things may not be applicable. So I always advise you, maybe you want to use, make use of the uh, library, right? Uh, Patari has access to a lot of databases, even a shared network with other libraries in the world, including uh, all the libraries in Malaysia. So do that kind of search first, right? Don't rely on Google Scholar alone or don't rely on Google itself. A lot of students, they, they go to Google Scholar, they can't find it, and they claim, they tell the supervisor or they tell the lecturer, I cannot find this article. There's no, no, no one has done this before. How sure are you, right? Always has that uh, mentality of uh, justifying whatever claim you try to do. Okay. Any other question before we end? I think that's all. Uh, we overshoot the time already. Um, the this page is there, so you can just you can just uh, browse through the link that I give you later. Right. Again, my my hope for all of you is when you when you are in the mode of improving your in the mode of info, improving your academic writing style, uh, don't, don't treat like tools will change everything, right? Like uh, the famous saying again, right? Uh, uh, you know, a tool for a fool is still a fool, right? <laughs> because if you do not know how to use the tool, you still can't improve, right? So uh, bottom line, get the mentality straight that you want to improve the writing read through what people have done and try to diversify the way you change certain sentences. Cuba ubah sikit gaya kita, mempersembahkan point kita, put up some citation evidences to back up our ideas. Not enough by just making claims, right? Making general claims because this is not, this is no longer PMR or SPM level kind of 
essay where you can just make any claims you like without uh, evidences or support. Okay. Any other questions? I will upload the uh, the this session online. Then you can go back to the same link just now, bit.ly.ly, FSK, uh, writing FSKPM to, to, see the, to see the video here, all right? Any question? No? Clear? Clear that you do also. Can we scan the attendant again? Uh, that one, uh, Nora. Uh, Nora will, 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 will show it. Any other question? Hope it's clear. Guys, uh, do you have any question uh, to Mr. Kiman? If there's any doubt, please let me know. Theoretical problem statement, same thing. Uh, sorry, nah, same thing. Maksud dia, tell people apa yang you, you have read about the theory, right? Whatever you have read about the theory. Um, Usually, uh, what we do in formal statement for theoretical is the, we try to show the contradiction. Maksudnya, perbezaan pendapat tentang teori tersebut. Mungkin A kata teori that, 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 that theory is good, that, that B say the theory is bad and all that. Try to show some controversial uh, point of view about the theory. Not about the good thing only. Uh, it's quite misleading sometimes. You know like for example, when you do, uh, bila kita buat research kan, bila kita kata problem statement tu, tiba-tiba when you read the problem statement, semua bagus. Virtuality is good, you know, virtuality is benefit, virtuality will help to solve this and that. Then I was, and then I will ask, I can, so, what is the problem that you want to solve if everything is good? You get I me? Mean? So it should be like, um, it should be like, um, when you do a problem statement part, it should show me, or show the reader that, you know, people have done this, they have not looked at this and that. Still some area for, for improvement, you know, ada lagi tempat yang kita boleh, Perbaiki or they overlook certain part, that's why you want to do it. Some, same thing lah. Even the theoretical part also. Show, show some comparison of uh, ideas. Like a theory, not everyone would agree to it, right? A would agree to it, B would agree to it, like, and all that, right? Uh, resource gap, kalau sekadar perbeza, this is the paling tak, paling tak cukup. <laughs> kalau at master's level, maybe it's accepted. If it's a PhD level, usually if you say perbezaan tempat itu memang tak cukup, right? It's not enough. Just because you do the study in Malaysia, then you claim that nobody has done it in Malaysia or in Sarawak or even specific di kampung saya, doesn't make uh, the research problem good, right? Uh, it means you highlight the, uh, even if you do some ge geographical differences, it should be more than just the geographical differences. For example, kalau you katalah urban and area, macam Martina cakap, urban and rural area, you shouldn't be highlighting the urban area as the main problem, right? The main problem is the access uh, to knowledge, for example, in the rural area. The, that, that, that key thing is the access to knowledge, not the rural area itself. So when you reword that way, it sounds more convincing than just saying, I'm doing this research because tak ada orang buat lagi di rural area. You get I me? Mean? It doesn't sound convincing. But if you say, uh, access to knowledge in rural area is very problematic. A student may not be able to get connected to the world, so they have insufficient blah, 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 right? And uh, studies so far have not looked into this area, or maybe they have looked into the area of uh, access to knowledge, but they forgot about such other variable like ethnicity, for example, then you might want to go deeper into that problem. It's not enough by just saying, oh, orang tak buat lagi di rural, so saya buat rural. How do you know? <laughs> All right, how sure are you? All right, orang tak buat lagi di kampung saya. Kenapa? Then I will ask you, kenapa kena buat di kampung you? All right, orang tak buat lagi di Sarawak. Kenapa kena buat di Sarawak? Well, how different is research in Sarawak and in Kelantan, for example? What is the important part? It's not the geographical part. It's the differences that you should be highlighting. It's the key variable that you should be highlighting, not just the geographical uh, differences. Two yeah, I want to say because every time I read this is memang just part lah. Even if you ask examiner, you bagi examiner, they will circle that some sort. Just because it's done in somewhere and then you want to do it in Malaysia, it doesn't, doesn't warrant the study to be very important. There must be something about the area that you're studying, let's say the kampung you, what is so special about the kampung maybe, right? Then that should be highlighted, not the kampung itself or not the location of the kampung itself. You get what I mean or not? I, I know what you're trying to tell me, but the way you write it, the way you position it matters more than that thing. So, kadang-kadang bila you, 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 read, you read the statement, uh, 
kajian ini telah dijalankan di pelbagai negara tapi belum lagi buat di Malaysia. Justru kajian ini nak buat di Malaysia. That's a bad one, right? That's not enough. Should be highlighting what is so special about Malaysia that this study should be done in Malaysia. Uh, okay, in terms of maybe perbezaan kaum, you know, perbezaan ideologi, that should be the highlight, not the locality. Okay, boleh faham? I, I hope that, I mean, that clear. But you can always consult your your supervisor. I'm sure, you know, um, your, a lot of lecturers have done this many times and they have examined many theses. So they will tell you that this is it's a weak point in in highlighting. All right? Even if you want to do in certain ge geographical location, you have to be so convincing that it's worthy to study that area and why. There's, there must be a reason why. All right? uh, workshop on systemic re systematic review I have uh, I'm not sure if I have time, but there's so many people doing systematic review already. So you, uh, probably you can join some. Um, I have some videos on um, all this thing, right? I have like how do you like discussion you know, on my YouTube channel. I will be sharing one on the uh, literature review soon. I have done one, but I didn't put it up online. But uh, I'll, I'll just put it up online. So maybe that would help. But uh, you can join other workshops. I mean, there are so many experts down out there that you you you'll be able to learn from. Uh, I, I also join them as well in, in a lot of uh, webinars. Any other question? If no, then I'll pass to Panora for the scanning. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming for this academic uh, writing workshop. I hope you guys uh, learn a lot here. Me too. Okay. Uh, so once again, uh, boleh kita give a big applause to Mr. Kiman. Tak tahu dengan kita. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ki. Uh, I call her Kiman je. Kan? Sometimes lebih mudah asalnya. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, accept saya punya invitation.